Okay. I think um, we just started the stream. Hopefully it's working properly. Let me know how I sound. Um, I did this software update a few days ago. And what happened during the, um, the updating process was pretty much a whole bunch of irregularities with like devices. So um, when I was trying to do a voiceover on some videos, I sounded like I was talking in, in super fast motion, like, like Mickey Mouse, like, you know, like I was sped up. And so I had to do like all this, all this kind of tinkering to, to fix that little issue. So hopefully I sound okay. Um, I also should probably pay close attention to chat here. Okay. So, yeah. A lot of weird technical difficulties since, since coming back on vacation. Um, so yeah, the first part was that, that software update. So I'm using a, a Mac and I updated to like the latest operating system, which is always um, a worry of mine because it, it seems to always mess up something. So I waited like a really long time before updating to the latest operating system. And still, I got this like weird thing with my, um, with my voice recorder. So hopefully I sound okay. So hello everyone. Um, today we're actually a little short staffed. Um, one of our usual guys that helps out during the live sales, Robbie, who you've probably heard me mention a few times. Um, unfortunately, he had like a death in the family. So um, the, the, the funeral is going on like right now. So uh, sorry about that. Shout out to, to Robbie. So today it's just gonna be me and um, Michael, who's gonna be operating the camera. And if you happen to see somebody chatting, that's Title Gardens, that could be my mom, possibly, it could be me. But um, chat is gonna be a little bit more of a free for all. Um, that does not mean that I won't ban people because I love banning people, so. Fair warning there. I might miss it though, because like half my attention won't be on, on chat, obviously. Okay, so. Um, we are a little bit early, so I'm not gonna start the actual sale portion just yet, but I just wanted to just kind of hang out a little bit and, and make sure everything is testing out all right. Um, if you hear that sound in the background, I don't know if you could hear it, but that's like the vents opening and closing. We're at that point in spring where it's actually chilly outside, but warm inside. So the, the greenhouse is trying to temperature regulate. So these uh, automatic vents are gonna be opening, closing, opening and closing. So if you hear that kind of grinding sound, that's that's those guys. So uh, the vacation was wonderful. Um, the only problem with the vacation, well, there's two problems with vacation. One is that I didn't really spend enough time there. Uh, the longest vacation that we could take was about seven days because my two travel companions, um, the, the whole vacation sprung up on like the, the shortest of notices. So um, it was a real tight turnaround just to get anybody to go with me. And um, you know, those two, they're, they're both lawyers. They have real jobs. They can't just like up and take off for like two, three weeks. So unfortunately they couldn't take off more than seven days. Um, we went out there, it was a great, great time. I wish it was at least 10 days, preferably closer to 14 days just because of, a, of how much traveling we were we were actually doing because um, we didn't stay on the mainland part of Japan very long. We basically hopped in to Tokyo and then hopped right back out to uh, Okinawa, which is about a three hour flight away because Okinawa is its own island if you didn't already know. Um, the that, So that was the first part, the vacation just wasn't long enough. The second problem is that I lost my phone on the first day. like taking the train from the airport to our downtown hotel in Tokyo. Um, my phone is a slippery iPhone, slipped out of my slippery pocket, and then poof, it's gone. The nice thing about losing a phone in Japan is that um, it's practically impossible to not get the phone back. Um, like culturally, it's not a thing just to pick up a phone and keep it. So if, if um, somebody finds your phone, there's a about a hundred percent chance that it's going to end up in a lost and found and you can go retrieve it. Problem is, um, I couldn't physically retrieve it because again, as I flew off to another island and I was never going to go back to downtown Tokyo. So my phone is in Japan. It's in a better place. So I had to get a new, a new iPhone. 
All right, so that happened. Uh, someday fly to South Korea. I was in South Korea three years ago. I had a really, really good time. I was in Seoul. Um, yeah. I wouldn't mind going back to Korea. I really like Korean food, especially. It was, it was a good time. And Seoul's a pretty amazing city. I remember that when I got off the plane in uh, Incheon, uh, I pretty much felt like I'd gone into the future 10 years. That's, that's the uh, immediate impression I got. I was very impressed with, uh, with Korea. Um, so the other thing that happened today, let, you know what, let me uh, go ahead and put up the rules here. And so you guys can read over that for, the, for those new to, to how a live sale actually works. So this morning has been all kinds of goofy. It first started out with, um, uh, I get a frantic call sa saying that, uh, you need to come out to the greenhouse because we have hanging, we hang our lights over our tanks. And one of these hanging uh, fixtures uh, just took a dive. Like the, one of the chain links broke and like two lighting fixtures went into the water. And that tripped uh, the breaker um, so all the water now drains into like our maintenance tubs. The maintenance tubs can't hold all the water, they overflowed. So we had to quickly swap out the lights because uh, they were actually used for this live sale. So if you see a couple tanks with goofy lighting, it's because it's not really supposed to be those lights to begin with. The real lights are filled with salt water right now. So luckily, nobody got electrocuted or anything. That could have been bad, but yeah. Today was off to like a heck of a start already with that. Uh, some equipment failures there. The other thing that you may or may not notice is the camera. We're still using uh, the, the Canon C100 cinema camera, but what's gonna look a little bit different, it's, it's gonna be a much wider angle of view. It's not gonna be like up close macros of the individual corals. Reason for that is uh, the lens that I use for travel is, uh, is another lens, it's a really, really nice lens, but it's, it's much wider, it's, it's good for you know, just general shooting. Well, it's stuck, like physically stuck in the camera. So it's like the wrong lens to shoot a live sale with, like to do close-ups of coral. So uh, when we start to shoot like the frags and things like that, you're probably gonna notice that you're gonna see like three or four frags in the frame. It's because it's a very wide angle lens. And once we're done with this show, I'm gonna have to send off my camera to Canon to get it repaired. But yeah, it's not letting go of this particular lens. I did a quick search on YouTube as to like how to undo it. But the only videos that I was able to find on YouTube to kind of like instruct, it's um, uh, like somebody had a, a very inexpensive lens that has a plastic mount. And if you twist hard enough, you break the plastic mount and you can get it off. Unfortunately, this is not an inexpensive lens. This is a very expensive lens and the mounts are metal. So I'm not gonna rip a metal lens off of a metal mount. So it's gonna go back to Canon. So you will have to bear with me on, on my little camera things. You, you know what? I bet if I didn't even mention it, you guys wouldn't have really noticed, but I noticed it because it's really, really peeving me off right now. All right, so fun times already this morning. Thank you for joining. I'm in such a great mood. Um, so the rules, how does this work? Uh, you probably need to open up two sites if you actually wanted to make purchases. Um, the live show exists on YouTube and it also exists on titlegardens.com. There is a live sale section that you can navigate to. It's, there's like a blinking red dot on the left navigation for the live sale. It's really, really easy to see. Uh, click on that and you, what you'll immediately see is this video show up again and then down below, you can see all the live sale items listed one through 200 today. Uh, they, you can check out with them just like any other items. You can mix and match items from the website and from the live sale, it doesn't really matter. Um, and just make sure to, to check out with them as you go because in order to actually get the item, you have to check out with it. Just having it in your cart doesn't reserve it. Somebody else can just come in and, and purchase that coral if they finish the checkout process. Um, you'll want to select the local pickup live sale option because shipping is a flat rate, $39.99, um, and you don't want to get charged multiple times. Somebody always ends up paying shipping like twice or something every live sale. It's no big deal, we'll refund you, but to avoid that, just select um, local pickup live sale and, and make sure you have either paid shipping once or included the shipping module once you're all done. So 
that pretty much covers the rules. I'll go over it maybe one or two more times um, throughout the show, but that's roughly how it works. The other thing is I'm probably going to be doing a little bit more storytelling on, on this uh, particular show. So um, I've kind of instructed uh, Michael to help me out with that. And we have like a, a two minute shot clock on these corals. So if I'm babbling too long, uh, he's just going to go to the next coral and he's going to tell me which um, overlay to, to pop up on the screen. So I kind of intend to speed things along as, as best I can here. All right, so let me uh, fiddle with this just a little bit here. Um, in the meantime, hope you guys are all done with the rules. Here's a shout out to the Patreon folks. So actually, you know the, the last video, I don't know if you've all caught it, but it was kind of like an overview of, of how we do the live sale, plus a little thing with the, um, with the, with the, the update on set two with our new tanks, right? So we're starting to, to plumb that system in. That was actually intended for the Patreon crowd, for the act, for the for those guys, um, but I didn't select the thing where it's only um, available to um, to those folks. So it was just available to everybody, and I just left it up there because it was a neat enough video. And um, at that point, it's like, why not just leave it up? So that those are the types of videos that the Patreon guys get. Like um, they just get like the iPhone um, tours and behind the scenes type stuff. So. That's a little taste. Uh, so thanks, you guys. Uh, Kevin, Nate, Luis, and Jeff. Um, it's a three months so far for all you guys. Awesome. Uh, OK, I'm going to position my chat so I can actually read what's going on. <clears throat> OK, and how many people are on 94? Nice. I expect more will we'll tune in later. Okay. All right, let's get going then. First item here. We've got some rainbow pectinia. So what to mention about um, the vacation? Because like the vacation went super well. I've done two videos so far on, on my trip out there. The first one was like a scuba diving video where um, we, let's see, it was um, just outside the resort. We really couldn't go any further out because that particular day was like a rainstorm, like a serious rainstorm. And so once you kind of get out past the little um, lagoon area, um, the, the, the waves got really, really choppy. So I was only able to go to that one dive spot. But it was a really cool dive spot because the, um, that, that area had all this mariculture activity that I wasn't expecting. When it first hit the water, looked around, it, it kind of looked barren. But, you know, after just like a little bit of swimming, there's like these endless fields of Acropora that people had planted on these stakes. So that was really cool to see. And they're huge colonies that, that um, have been just cultured there. And like the, you know, given that it was a really, really cloudy, stormy, dark day, you could still see all the different colors and everything like that. So it was definitely an impressive thing to just come upon like that. I do wish that I got to see other dive spots because I hear that Okinawa has some of the best diving in the world, like hands down. Um, but maybe that's just something I'll have to save for next time. Okay, next up. So, let's see. What other thing about, um, about Japan? The food there is just straight up unbelievable. Like, uh, the Japanese are, are, are very, 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 very detail-oriented when it comes to that sort of thing. So, um, when it comes to like cooking, a lot of it is, is about technique and precision. And the better that you can just execute any particular dish, all those little tiny refinements add up to a almost a completely different dish. So even if you're eating Western food over in Japan, chances are it'll be mind-blowingly good. And I, I always get spoiled when I go over there when it comes to like the cuisine because I, I just eat everything. I probably gained 10 pounds just from that. Okay. Yeah, James Jimenez, uh, where can I find the corals on your page? Uh, there's a live sale uh, 
button, basically, on the left navigation. It's, it's blinking red dot. Okay, uh, let's go to number three. Tricolor Oulophilia. Yeah, so the food was a big deal there, and the Okinawan cuisine is a little bit different than mainland China, or mainland China, jeez, Where, where's my head? Mainland Japanese cuisine. So, um, like, the, their noodles are different, for example, like, um, Okinawa is known for soba, which is a different soba noodle than um, what's traditionally served in, like, Tokyo, for example. So their, their Okinawa soba is a little bit closer to, to I guess, Tokyo ramen. Um, yeah, just different in general. But every bit is good. And strangely, the best sushi we had was not in Japan, or not in like Tokyo, Japan, but it was in Okinawa, Japan. Okay. Next up, number four. This is a pink and green platygyra. Let's see. What other thing was really, really neat? The weird thing about um, where we were staying in, um, in Okinawa was we had kind of unseasonably weird weather with how cloudy it was and how rainy. We only had maybe like a day and a half at most of sunshine, which was kind of a bummer. We didn't get to, to hit like a lot of the national park type areas or anything like that. We did a little bit but weather wasn't cooperating too much and we didn't get into the ocean nearly as much as we would have liked just because like uh, you would see either low tide or um, or just straight up storming but there's still so much else to do like we visited the aquarium for example on um, on a really kind of crummy day that was the second video by the way if you hadn't caught that we uh, did an overview of like the Okinawa aquarium so it's still a very 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 nice aquarium it used to be the biggest in the world Let's go to number five. That might be a, a, a thing that I want to do more and more. Like do more dive videos and do more public aquarium videos. I've, I've started to become like a public aquarium snob because I've, I've been to so many now and there's so many good ones, but there's a lot of really boring meh ones which are a little bit better than a, like a good pet store. So. I probably won't be reviewing too many of those, but like the really good ones, um, I want uh, to make a special visit to. Like for example, I want to hit the Georgia Aquarium uh, because they have, if you've seen the, the video for the Okinawa Aquarium, they have this gigantic aquarium um, display called the Kurushio Sea that's, uh, that has like three whale sharks in it. And at the time when it was built, it was the biggest single aquarium in the world, single display at two million gallons. The Georgia Aquarium's um, giant ocean view uh, system that they have is six million gallons. It's, it's three times the size of the one that's in Okinawa. And not only is it three times the size, but they have dive trips where you can dive in that particular aquarium. So obviously I'm all, I'm all on board with that. I wanna dive with whale sharks in captivity, which, I don't know, that might not be that cool because whale sharks don't do well in captivity, but I want to have that experience while it's still available. Okay, we're moving on to six. It's the shot clock. <laughs> yeah, basically, I, I figured that I was gonna be doing a lot of babbling. Um, so, yeah, the shot clock is in effect, so just to keep this thing moving. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, George Aquarium is on my list. If you guys follow uh, Thomas Vision Reef, Thomas Brown, he lives in, in the Atlanta area, so I definitely want to stop in, say hello to him. I've only met him like a couple of times at like the, the uh, trade shows. Like I met him in Macna in Denver, and then Macna again in DC for like five minutes. But um, we're still you know, working on some stuff you know, behind the scenes a little bit. And then, um, yeah, he's like all aboard trying uh, to go diving in that giant fish tank as well. So one of these days, I, I hope to make that happen. Why not in the sea? Uh, yeah, actually, I want to see... Um, <laughs> people can see uh, your reflection, so they said, hi, mom. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is a... Um, a migration of whale sharks that happens in Mexico, and I love to I love to go to Mexico, but the, the migration happens like in August, and Mexico in August is 
blazing, flaming hot. Um, it's like 110 degrees there at that time. But supposedly there's hundreds, if not thousands, of whale sharks that show up right around, uh, right a, like just a little bit north of Cancun. And so that is also like a bucket listy thing that I want to do, is just to jump in the water uh, during that, that migration season. What kind of lights are these corals under? They are under T5s. Now, um, if you were here at the beginning of the show, I had mentioned that uh, some of these lights fell into the, into the tank. So I'm not 100% sure what bulbs these are. These are probably some just cheap actinic bulbs right now. Okay, we're moving to number seven. Yeah, the, the focus does seem a little bit off. A little, little blurry. Still a little blurry. Okay. Yeah, okay, focus is a lot better. Yeah, with the new lens, it's like everybody has to, to relearn how to how to do everything. There we go, that's a lot better. Okay, what were we talking about? I don't know, let's go to number eight. This is a abysmal worm rock. So the, the underlying coral is parietes, so you have to give it a little bit of light, but these, uh, these worms are essentially filter feeders. They do well so far with like rotifers and stuff like that. We've even had one that the coral has died, but the um, the worms themselves still persisted, and I think that was just because of regular feeding. Because usually when the coral dies, um, the worms don't do so well. So let's see, what other thing um, was cool about that trip? We did a lot of reef walking, um, which is like where the tide goes out and just exposes a whole bunch of stuff, and you can kind of like walk around to the exposed areas and see all kinds of stuff in like the tide pools and things like that. So we did that quite a bit. It was a very eye-opening experience to do that because first of all, um, when we talk as, as hobbyists, I know that people freak out um, once they get a controller and they see like the temperature fluctuation in their tank and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't want my temperature to fluctuate more than one degree ever. And in our tanks here, uh, we can sometimes see a four to six degree temperature swing each day. And I was like, wow, four to six degrees, that's a lot. So one degree temperature swing, it's like, I would love to have that. And I know some people are even like crazy where they like, they freak out over like 0.3 degree temperature changes. Let me tell you, these corals in the wild definitely do not care because during low tide, these, uh, these corals are completely exposed to air. So um, the third video that we will be putting up sometime next week, probably middle to end of next week, um, we'll show you some footage of stuff that we saw during the reef walk where you'll just see animals that are just completely on dry land essentially. Like cucumbers, starfish, corals, clams, everything is just exposed, right? Okay, I'm going to number nine. This is a walking dendro. Um, and they're completely exposed to air. And immediately I'm thinking, I wanna save everything, right? I wanna grab these things and put them into the water. So I was thinking about that a little bit more and it, it, it kind of occurred to me that this is like 5 p.m. every afternoon for them. Like twice a day, they, they go through this where it's like, oh, tide goes out, you have to hang out on dry land for a few hours and then tide comes back in. It's just like no big deal. And um, I, w I saw brain corals, like brain corals. Think of like how fleshy brain corals are. They get completely exposed. And it must have been doing this like for years because it's a, it's a large brain coral and it just doesn't care. You see Acropora colonies, they don't care. But the craziest, trippiest thing was seeing um, clams. Because these Maxima clams, in my dive video, you probably noticed that there's clams everywhere. Like every five feet, seemingly, in these rocks, there's a Maxima clam. Well, these Maxima clams are literally five feet off of shore. 
and during um, low tide when you're doing the reef walking they're everywhere and not only are they just out in the open but they're not even closed like their mantles are fully extended like it's as if they were they were just underwater they're gonna open up bright sunshiny weather or whatever they're just gonna open up and I found that to be completely insane because we struggle mightily with keeping clams here like they just don't do well people always ask are you gonna get any clams I'm like well I don't know they kind of die here a lot so it's not great for us I, I will say one thing about this walking dendro before we move on to number 10 the reason why it's called a walking dendro is that there's actually a peanut worm that lives inside this thing. There's a tiny little hole at the bottom of this coral and in that hole is that worm. And so when you put this guy in the substrate, over time it does kind of scoot around because it's this worm that's dragging the rest of the coral around with it. So it's kind of a neat little oddball piece. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Let's just go ahead and move on to, to 10. We'll do that in a sec. We have to move the, the camera rig. So we do have that system that's going to be set up just for clams. And, I, and after what I saw in, in the reefs, it's like, I should be able to keep clams. I really should. Like, the fact that I can't do it well right now, I, I look at it as like a mark of embarrassment because of what I've seen. Like, they, they have tourists stomping all over them in, on dry land, and they seem to be fine. Yet, I can't keep them alive under very, very you know, good conditions or hopefully good conditions it's kind of silly so yeah I, I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm up for the challenge let's just say so that was like a, a very interesting thing that that we noticed um, was just like how incredibly resilient these animals were and the other thing is um, like I mentioned it was raining much of the time that we were there so in addition to them being exposed just to air they're getting rained on like with fresh water like as if a faucet was turned on them and they're not dying. Like, if I did that to an Acropora in my systems here, it would be about 20 seconds before that coral died. But out there, for hours, these corals are getting rained on, and they're not, they're not dying. So, yeah, it, like the, the ocean is just a very different place. And, you know, the, the more that I can kind of get out to those types of places and shoot video, and just to see what's possible, it really kind of puts things into perspective as to how we do the hobby, I think. <clears throat> okay, so... Somebody's asking, um, I live about 20 minutes from you guys in Copley. Could I come pick up my coral in person? Yes, just send me an email and we'll set up a, an appointment. Okay. So we're going to be going through like a whole bunch of uh, Leptoceras here. Um, they're growing kind of out of control, so... A lot of these are going to be a little bit less expensive this time around than before. Um, the next one here, the number 11, is a jack-o'-lantern Leptoceras. So the difference between like the jack-o'-lantern and the Ultra that you see to its left is that the Ultra has like a, a lot more of like the green eyes going on. Number 12, there's that ultra that I, that I mentioned. It's a slightly larger one than uh, the one next to it. We'll just go ahead to, to that. That's number 13. It's a little less expensive. So yeah, so the ultras have like a lot more of that greenish yellow at their eyes. Hmm, so the... These guys, they seem to be really um, pretty flexible in terms of lighting, pretty flexible in terms of flow. We've kept them under pretty much every kind of lighting and every kind of flow, and they've just been growing like gangbusters for us. So we expect that they should probably do well in most types of aquariums. Yeah, I see that in chat, you're talking about like hair of, of clams. Um, it's almost always preferable to get a larger clam than a smaller clam because the, the smaller clams um, rely a lot more on, on consuming like bacteria and phytoplankton and stuff like that. Whereas larger clams, like the vast majority of their nutrition comes from light. Meaning, however, that you need to provide a lot of light. Uh, okay, let's go to the number 14. 
this is an, uh, a golden leptoceras, and I think that the next few are going to be these golden leptoceruses. Um, Noah, I got a Durasa clam from a while ago. It's been doing amazing. I have a maxima. They started out the same size. The Durasa is nearly double the size of the maxima. That's great. Ours are probably dead. <laughs> so you're doing better than me right now. Um, that's, I guess that's another thing to bring up is about lighting. So we grow most everything under low light. Uh, our greenhouse is heavily shaded because we tend, like for, for whatever reason, um, Ohio sunlight during the summertime really makes stuff unhappy. So we just started to block out more and more of it over the years. Um, now, what I noticed though was in, in, in Okinawa, when it was sunny, it's really, really bright, like really bright. You couldn't really duplicate that level of intensity in a home aquarium. And not only that, but it's, it's not that, oh, it's just, it's because it's under 30 feet of water. It's not, sometimes they're like under no water and these clams and stuff like that are wide open. So I've pretty much realized that there's no amount of light that you can't put on top of some of these corals and, and clams which is so counterintuitive to my experience growing coral in a greenhouse here. Cause like, it seems like in the winter time where it's dark, everything did better. Everything still does better in the winter and, and, and fall compared to spring and summer. Um, but the, yeah, that's hard to reconcile. Cause like out there in the wild, they're probably getting at least a hundred times more light than what I'm seeing here, at least. So yeah, take that for what it's worth. Okay, next up, number 15. What about the Pico series you announced months ago? So Michael, I don't think has set up his. And I think that Robbie, his is really struggling. So, I don't know, there's not a lot of Pico tanks to shoot here. Okay, and lastly, number 16 is the last of these Leptosiruses. So let's go ahead and, um, and scoot the whole rig and um, we'll go on to number 17 here in a moment. Uh, when are we going to get an update video in our buddy's 240 Starfire tank? Uh, we're never gonna get that update because he quit the hobby. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he actually took that, that tank down and sold it. He just lost interest entirely. Like after all that work, even just getting it down there because it was a super heavy tank. Like. I don't know if I, I mentioned it in that video, but it's made of three-quarter glass. So the thing probably weighs like over a thousand pounds. And it took like a whole bunch of guys to even move that tank into place. And uh, yeah, it's not there anymore. Rob Mikowski, how difficult are Bismarck rocks to keep? Um, pretty straightforward. I mean, if you've ever kept any SPS, I don't think it's a lot going to be a lot different than that, except for the filter feeding worms themselves. Um, I would just try to keep the coral itself healthy and typically the worms kind of handle themselves. Melissa Hope, if I order today, when is the expected arrival day? We usually ship out Monday for delivery Tuesday, the vast majority of the time. Okay, so we were getting glare from hell and a lot of that has to do with like uh, the, the wide angle of the lens. It's just picking up a lot more stuff, whereas the other one tends to focus in a bit better. But yeah, that's a ton of glare. Uh, you might see it to, to flip that light away. Nope, that's not it. No, we're just gonna have to deal with the glare. Um, so that's a pink tip hammer. It's not that light. Yeah, it's that one there. I wouldn't worry about it. All right, let's go to number 18. We can just finish up this side really quickly. This is an Indonesian blue tip hammer. How does that one look with the flashlight? Oh. I should probably have mentioned that with the flashlight stuff. Um, occasionally, uh, you, can, you can probably even just see him doing it in the reflection. 
but we shine um, a light onto the corals just to like help the uh, to bring out the fluorescence, just to give you like a different look. Because I think that the light on that tank right now might be like a 10k and an actinic, but it's like an inexpensive one that probably just came with the fixture. Moscow corals. How long can the corals stay alive during transportation? You really don't want it to go more than 24 hours, if at all possible. All right, next up, number 19. Indonesian Golden Hammer. That's probably one of my favorite Indonesian hammers. There's like a, I really like the sky blue one, which unfortunately we, um, we only have like a few of and we're trying to grow out, so, you, so that's not available right now. But uh, my second choice would be this, uh, this Indonesian Golden. Lars, I have a toadstool leather that when I woke up today, I noticed it turned brown and wilted completely. Is there any saving this guy? Depends, I mean, if, it, is it, if it's really dead and dying, that's one thing. But a lot of times leathers will contract and um, get a waxy, like a waxy coat. And then after f maybe like four days to a week, we'll shed that waxy coat and extend even larger. They go through that cycle every, every month or so. Okay, next up, number 20. This is an Australian green frog spawn. So these are those Yaya Menses frog spawns. I stopped typing all that out because it just eats up all the, all the, all the text room. All right, next up, 21. This is the Australian yellow tip frog spawn. I have a golden hammer, but it seems they grow very, very slowly. It depends on which kind you get. Like a lot of the Australian varieties, they tend to grow a lot more slowly than the Indonesian varieties. Okay. All right, let's move on. Number 22. So that's probably the most expensive coral that we've got going on today. Let's see here. First ban of the day. So, uh, okay, moving on to number 23. One of the girls that I, that I was out in Okinawa with was um, Suzanne, who you might remember from um, the Halloween live sale. She was the one that was moderating chat that day, and I think that she has like the record for banning uh, the most number of people. I think she banned like five people that day. Good times. All right. So, let's see. So that's the peach colored tannery. It looks a lot more red than, uh, than I thought it would. The next one is actually the red. So that's number 24. Yeah, see how it's a lot more deep red? Okay, 25. It's gonna be an Australian Duncan. <clears throat> What's the difference between a rainbow canthophilia and ultra rainbow canthophilia? Probably nothing really. It's just a naming. I mean, there are. I mean, there's different intensities of color, things like that. But um, actually, let me. Oops, mistake. I should probably have gone through and removed some things from the website. 
because I think that there might be duplicated on there. So I'll kind of just do that in the background here. Yeah, because some of the stuff was like a what you see is what you get quality. We just ended up putting on the live sale for a little bit less. Yeah, like this guy here. I need to remove this guy temporarily. That would be bad if like somebody purchased it on the website and on the live sale separately. That would be a little awkward. And I think there's a couple other corals that I'll have to quickly remove here. Actions, change status, disable, submit. Okay. All right. So let's see here. What's the difference? What calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium levels do you maintain at your facility? Right now it's a little all over the place. Let's go on to number 26. It's the larger of the two Duncans. Okay, so 25 was a Duncan for 20. Number 26 is a Duncan for 45. Okay, because it's like triple the size. Calcium, alkalinity, magnesium. So let's see, I, I'm looking at my, my board here because we, we scribble it down. Calcium averages about 450 to 500. Alkalinity. Uh, not super great. Um, about seven DKH. And one of them is like impossibly low. It's just saying that's 3.5, which is unlikely, but I don't know. It could just be from, uh, from when we just did like a, a water change and it might've just been goofed up because of that chemistry. Uh, okay, next up, number 27. 27. Is uh, an ultra plate. So these guys have like streaks of uh, bright orange and bright green, and it's ones that you can propagate. They have like a, uh, a kind of like a scalloped bottom, so you can break them apart. Where you know like the the ones that are like complete circles, they don't really propagate that well. Okay, number twenty-eight, and you, you asked about magnesium too. Uh, looks like an average of about 1400. Most of them are 1500, but one's like 1350. So this little uh, plate is like pretty tiny. It's probably just a little over an inch. So in case you didn't already know, uh, plate corals, you have to put them on a substrate um, because they are one of the few corals that can kind of expand and contract to the point where they're able to move around. So if you put them on your rocks, they'll jump off. So you don't want that to happen. Also, what I've noticed is you really don't want to put them on sand. Um, we used to have like a, a tank with sand that we put all of our fungias on and we would just lose them occasionally. Um, and I learned later that in the wild, they're never really on sand substrates. They're almost on like the bumpiest, um, like, pretty much like crushed coral, but it's not even that crushed. It's like full colonies of coral, practically, of dead coral. So the, almost like the thicker the rubble, the better. So ever since then, we've, um, we've started keeping them either on like a complete bare bottom tank or on something that's very rubbly. Okay, let's go on to number 30. Or no, 29. 29 is a green and purple plate. So this green and purple plate has a little bit of a story. This was a, a hitchhiker. Um, it's really strange because at first it looks like a, a blastomusa almost. It has that, uh, that kind of that shape and it's attached to, to something. It, it's actually growing 
um, from a stem. And over time, it kind of, uh, I guess, erodes off of that stem and then becomes like a, a plate like this. And when we first got it, it must have been like no bigger than like my pinky nail. And now it's at least three inches, um, probably getting close to four inches in size. It, they grow incredibly quickly. All right, number 30 is a red plate. We normally would like flip this guy up so you can see it, but um, it's a circle. You'll have to get the idea that way. Because if we put it up, what'll happen is, I mentioned that they can move. It would have moved by now. Yeah, they get, uh, these guys like start off as small hitchhikers, but they, they grow really, really quickly. We have this, another small one that's about the size of a 50 cent piece, a little bit bigger than a quarter. Um, and it's the same variety, it's that purple variety. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, this will take just a moment. And hopefully, uh, when because we're going to be switching sides now, um, which you could see in, in that little uh, behind the scenes video, like how it's all laid out. But we're going to flip the whole thing around, and hopefully, fingers crossed, that's going to take care of our glare issue because that glare was something else. Checking chat here. How often do you feed them? I guess I don't make like a concerted effort to feed corals much these days. I kind of just uh, broadcast feed everything. I'm more like just trying to feed the fish and whatever makes it to the corals makes it to the corals. I haven't been doing like a, like a lot of heavy um, spot feeding or anything like that lately. Are your tanks ultra low nutrient? Uh, actually, definitely no. It's the, almost the exact opposite. Is that why you're keeping your DKH at that level? No, I think our DKH is low because it's just deciding to be a little goofy. I would obviously prefer my DKH to be higher, like closer to 12, but it's just not happening that way. And the other thing is like we, for a while had like really high nitrate and I, I'm curious to see what it's at now. Uh, we finally got a, our shipment of a pallet of salt. So we've been really ramping up our water changes. Um, this tank here, that's like super overexposed, in case you're wondering, Michael. There we go, much, much better. So this tank here got two consecutive water changes. Um, one on like Tuesday and then one on Friday, yesterday. So hopefully a lot of the stuff in here is doing better. And definitely better in terms of glare, so that's good. Any scalemia or acan lords? We definitely will have acan lords. Um, no scalemia, because I don't think that we even have any scalemia. We have one that's like really struggling that we wouldn't be selling. All right, next up, uh, 32. It's a smaller elegance, different color. This guy's like a, a bright green. Do you run two-part or calcium reactors? We run calcium reactors. So basically everything is uh, calcium reactor plus water change. The, um, the water change part of it had been kind of falling to the wayside just because we physically ran out of salt, but we're, like I said, really ramping it up now. We do at least two water changes a week, and each water change is a little over 150 gallons, to give you an idea of how many that is. So when we're on our game, it's close to 450 to 600 gallons a week. All right, next up, uh, number 33. That'll have to be uh, dialed up because it's really dark. better. So this is where I mentioned that the, having um, the macro lens would have helped. You kind of can't get a lot of 
really close uh, vision on some of these. Do you think the cart can be scooted any closer, Michael? Yeah. That might that might help just a little bit. Uh, what are your views on coral supplements like Coral and Zuck or Red Sea Reef Energy Color ABCD? So I haven't used any of those before personally. Um, I think in smaller aquariums they might work out nicely because I because the the expense of doing it on large systems might not be practical because so uh, each of our systems is at least a thousand gallons. So if you can probably imagine the, the cost of scaling up dosing um, expensive additives to a system of that size, it's just not gonna work. Especially since we have five systems, five, that are a thousand or more. Okay, so next up, number 34. It says it's a red acan. It looks almost like a peach color. And that might need to be brightened up just a little bit more, Michael. How hard is it to take care of heliofungia? I had one of my pistol shrimp managed to get sand on it, and unfortunately that part died. Um, heliofungia have a terrible reputation in the hobby. Um, they're really well known for being like a large super large inexpensive coral and it's because um, I don't know too many stores that go out of their way to order it what tends to happen is they'll survive for about a month and then they will suddenly overnight die and that's a kind of like a recurring trend with that coral they just simply do terribly in captivity I'm not really sure why that is okay next up number 35 is a green a can and these are uh, the, the ones that we've covered so far are Lord Hellensis's, Akan Lords. What do you think about Triton? I don't really think about Triton. So there, there's a bunch of these services popping up now, which it's like, um, like a, they're basically running samples uh, of your water. You send in like a water sample, and they'll do something like um, like liquid chromatography, maybe gas chromatography. Unlikely that they're doing like mass spec, but they're basically doing like a characterization. Uh, of what's in your water and can give you like a really really good idea of what's going on um, it could be good I mean they're, they're, you, for, for, like, for fifty dollars to get a sample done that is super duper extra mega cheap well, it's entirely possible that the lab is losing money at that rate because uh, one of my um, other friends uh, is a she's into pharmaceutical pharmaceutical chemistry and to do uh, like a series of tests, you know, for uh, like a number of different compounds, yada yada yada, with uh, with LC or GC, you should expect to pay between one hundred to two hundred dollars for pharmaceutical grade results. So fifty dollars to test your water is actually super cheap. So um, that part of it is is great value. I think that um, on top of that, you know, they they sell like a line of supplements so if, if you're like low on boron they have like a specific boron supplement or something along those lines um i don't know how much those are but um yeah i mean it's, i think it's definitely worth a try it's, it's certainly i would expect it to be much much more accurate than like um, a hobbyist test kit that does a titration for example i guess i was never that curious about it because i mean you see our chemistry it's like way off to begin with so I guess I don't chase numbers quite so uh, diligently as others. All right, number 36. This is a pink Aiken Bauer Banky. Next up, number 37. These are Micromusas. So they look like Acan Bauer, or they look like Acan Lords. And especially when they've been in these systems for a long time, the size gets to be really close to an Acan Lord. But um, 
usually you can tell micromusa by their pattern and also because they're usually a quarter of the size but once they've been in these systems and being fed regularly they get every bit as big as a as an Aiken Lord because if you go to, to number 38 38 is also uh, a micromusa and it is uh, you can see it on the left there it is every bit um, the size of a, good, a typical Lord D from Brooklyn I did the $49 test and it was extremely informative I bet I mean and the thing is it's much uh, are you on number 38, Michael? Is it still? There we go. So a little behind the scenes chatter. Sometimes the slider will, uh, will refuse to, to operate if you hit the end of it, it has to restart. So sometimes that's the, the lag. Do you notice Aiken's regularly changing color if, diff if you feed different foods? No, it's more of a lighting thing. Uh, going from like LED to T5 to metal halide, that sort of thing, can drastically change color. Um, haven't noticed it quite so much with food. <clears throat> uh, let's see, 39. It's a Hills Have Eyes chalice. Little brighter. So these guys have like a, a purple um, body, green eyes, bright green eyes. I think I mentioned in every live sale, but chalices is probably the most unhelpful um, kind of naming convention for a huge number of really different corals that are all kind of plate looking. Um, their care requirements can be completely all over the map. They can be completely different in terms of growth rate, aggressiveness, how easy they are to keep. The list goes on. So whenever you um, are trying to like look up care requirements for chalices, kind of take it with a grain of salt because they might be talking about a very different animal than what you have. Do you still believe that Astria snails are the best for a cleanup crew? Um, let's go to number 40 real quick and I'll get to that answer. A little brighter also, please. Um, do I still believe that they're the best? I'll say this. I think they do the best job of cleaning corals, or cleaning around corals especially. Like, if you have um, a ton of algae or something like that growing really cl in close proximity to polyps, for example, like zoanthids, where you really physically can't get in there with a toothbrush or something to clean it out, these snails will do th perhaps the best job without bulldozing. So another really great algae eater is like a Mexican turbo snail. Uh, problem is a Mexican turbo snail, they're big, they're very strong, and they knock stuff over. So you're kind of balancing that aspect out a little bit. Um, the problem with Astria snails is sometimes they'll like flip over, and when they flip over, they can't flip themselves back over, and so they die if you don't help them out. That's definitely a downside. So there's another type of snail. Um, it's, a, it's a Pacific snail called um, a, what are they, a trochus. Sometimes they're called like a, a, a tiger trochus or a turban snail. Those guys have like a more black on their body and they have a, a, like a kind of a striped um, patterning on their shell, which otherwise kind of looks like an astria. Uh, those guys are much more athletic and can flip themselves back over. And I think they come close to, um, to like an Astria's ability to clean, but it might not be quite as voracious of an eater. So you, you kind of have to take the good with the bad. And I think they, have, they might be more expensive too. Number 41, this is a lunar chalice. Can you mix different types of chalice? Um, you see how close these guys are? If the water blows the wrong way and one leans into the other, there's a good chance one of those two is gonna die tomorrow. Like that, that's how severe they sting one another. So definitely no, like chalices are one of the most um, aggressive when it comes to like contact. They immediately burn. So they either they die instantly or something they touch dies almost instantly. So I wouldn't go out of my way to try to put them very close to one another. Do you have a genus of the Hills Have Eyes Chalice? I couldn't find it via Google. Um, not off the top of my head. 
You might want to search for like Echinopora. That um, might get you close. Uh, Mycidium is another uh, popular um, chalice variety. Oxypora is another one. So you can like look at those three to start with. Most chalices um, are usually one of those three types. Oxypora, Mycidium, or Echinopora. But there, like I said, there's a there's a bunch of others. Like like later on, we'll show you like a lithophyllin, which doesn't look like any of these guys, but is technically a chalice. Okay, uh, 42. This is the mean green chalice. <clears throat> okay. Next up, 43, a pink striped chalice. Aaron's Hobbies, about one mushroom and it's spread to a garden of them. Is it normal? It is. Um, I, I'm gonna assume that it's a, probably a discosoma, like if it has like a smooth skin to it. Uh, those uh, propagate by, um, by pedal laceration, uh, P-E-D-A-L as in foot. I have to always clarify that, but um, what, what it's doing there is it scoots along and leaves behind bits of its foot behind, and um, each little piece of foot there, I guess, um, what, what happens is that that turns into a full mushroom. So after a while, you have a whole bunch of them doing that, you get a, a garden of them. Next up, number 44, will be a red chalice, you probably saw a little sneak peek of that. So one of the things that I wish I saw while diving was some zoanthids. I've never actually seen zoanthids in person diving. Um, and especially I think Japan has some really strange ones or some really, really attractive ones. There's a, a, a dive location that was probably 30 minutes away from my hotel where a lot of them were found. It's called Chatan, C-H-A-T-A-N, but I wasn't able to go. Next time, right? And also, I wish that I was, uh, I wish I had my camera. Like, I, I bought, just for this particular trip, just for this Japanese trip, I bought a little Sony underwater camera, which you can see in the dive video, obviously. I didn't have that for my trip to um, Hawaii, where I actually did three different dives. And that one would have been a cool one to see because um, there's definitely some cool stuff there. Let's go to number 45 real quick. Is it, did it die again? There we go. So um, one of the dives that I did in Hawaii was uh, a wreck dive. It was actually like a fighter plane from World War II. And I mean, that in itself, it, it's kind of cool. But what's, what really was neat was that the entire area around it was like a sand, sandy bed. And there was like a million garden eels, as far as the eye could see, in every direction. So you have like this plane sitting there, but all around it is garden eels. It's really slick. Any care tips for these chalices? The safest bet is to go medium everything, medium flow, medium light, and don't let it touch anything. 46, it's a mystery chalice. This might be one of my favorite chalices right now. I love the color. And it's developed great coloration given like the, the, the timing. Usually uh, springtime isn't uh, the best for coral coloration, but this guy's still looking great. Yeah, unfortunately, no shipping outside the U.S. I was actually talking about that with my importer buddy, and uh, he said that it's not just an issue of sending stuff. For example, if I wanted to send something to Miss Saltwater Tank, um, it's not just setting it up from my end, because it's like it's, it's a big ordeal for me to send it. First of all, so I have to take it to a fet, to a 
Fish and Wildlife Field Office, which is going to be either New York or Chicago, each of which is six hours away from me. Then um, I need to do like CITES paperwork, um, plus have an export license, which I have. Um, and that paperwork can be about $200 per shipment. The shipment itself might be a couple hundred dollars, so expect to pay about three to four hundred dollars per box for to to get it anywhere out of the country. But then, that's just me getting it out of the country. There's an entirely different problem once it arrives at wherever it's supposed to go. A lot of places, I guess, don't have the infrastructure to uh, even handle it. So it'll just sit in customs. It's like, hmm, it looks like we need some wildlife officer to look at this for CITES treaty international stuff there's nobody here for that so everything just dies as it sits getting held in customs because because there's no um just there's no process for that there so like i could probably for a small fortune send some corals to like italy or croatia or wherever in the eu once it gets there who knows what's going to happen? And I think that's an entirely different problem that I just didn't even realize. So, yeah, it's going to be a long time before I figure that stuff out. 47. 47. This is a blue moon chalice. These guys grow very quickly. <clears throat> yeah, and so it's so Olga. Uh, we need to have license to receive living animals. Right, so in, a, in addition to me needing an export license, on the other end they would need to have an, have an import license, plus um, all the regulatory stuff to handle CITES, all of that fun stuff. And also the paperwork is weird because you know it's like you need to show um, something to do with uh, like a re-export sometimes so if I bring something in I have to like show that it was brought in correctly under CITES to get into the US but I don't know how that plays with stuff that's been propagated for years because I don't know what year or who was even president when we first got Xenia but we've you know we probably purchased a little thing a long time ago and now it's a forest of Xenia we have no paperwork for that so I don't know if like we could ever just send Xenia Overseas. I have no idea. So, number 48. This is a golden eye chalice. It's a little bit hard to see, but it actually has yellow eyes. Yeah. Kind of weird. Let's see if the flashlight helps it any. Yeah, a tad. For some reason, it's showing up a lot more purple than I'm used to. Like, to my to my eyes, it's like red and yellow. So let's see, Copen has, and I live right next to the airport. That's another thing that I that, and, and I'm sorry, like the, the the example I'm using is very EU centric. I know that I've got a lot of people, um, you know, asking me about South America and stuff like that. But um, I know that a lot of uh, a lot of places that have um, like trade agreements, like the European Union, um, they also um, have like expedited things between countries. So, if I was able to, for example, get it into Copenhagen, um, getting it from Copenhagen to anywhere else in the EU might be super easy. But it's just that initially getting it from the U.S. into the EU is wait actually is Copenhagen is is that Sweden, and is that even in the Denmark. EU? Denmark. I forget if Denmark is even in the EU, because I know like a lot of the Scandinavian countries aren't. Like Iceland, I don't think, is a part of the European Union. <sighs> I don't know. I'm American. Like, we're bad at geography. Like, really bad. Okay, next up, 49. It's another Hollywood stunner. Do you still see new coral variations coming in? The majority of what you sell can't be purchased over here, yet occasionally we get something rare, but nothing like what the U.S. seems to get. So first off, the U.S. market is roughly 70% of the entire world market. So there's a lot of incentive for collectors to basically send everything over to the U.S. And there's a huge incentive for like wholesalers in the U.S. to not really export because 
why would you want to export to the remaining 30% rather than just focusing on the 70% that's already domestic? So like my, um, the guy that's like kind of local here, it's about an hour away, where he does his own importing, um, I ask him all these export things and he's like, I don't know, I've never tried it because there's like almost no incentive. It's like I sell to 70% of the market here in the US. So um, do we see new stuff? We do. Um, it's not that often, I guess, that we see new stuff, but I, I'm going to wager to guess that we probably see new stuff more than other geographies, period. I, I'd be very surprised if another geography saw something before we saw it, even at any price point at this, at this time. Okay, let's go to 50. I don't know what kind of chalice this is. We used to know but I, I just forgot for the purposes of this live sale. It's kind of pinkish with, um, it's like a pastel-ish pink with uh, kind of yellowish orange eyes. It's not the fastest grower in the world, but it seems to have, uh, have healed up well from, from when we cut it. <clears throat> okay, let's go to 51, which is, another Hollywood Stunner Chalice. Do you have the WWC Jelly Bean Chalice? I am unfamiliar with that, and probably not. There's a, another uh, import place um, that is within driving distance. Um, and we, we've only visited them once, but it's, it's about three hours away. And they have different stuff from the, the guy that's one hour away. And so um, between the two, they, they get a lot of their stuff from different importers, or different, I should say, different exporters from uh, different regions. And yeah, there's definitely some, um, some unique stuff that can be seen at one versus the other, things like that. So maybe it's just a matter of sourcing, like just where you know, they, they have their, their connections with, with collectors overseas. I know one thing for sure. Like, the idea of doing mariculture after, after seeing um, what I've seen in Okinawa, uh, that whole thing has gotten a lot more interesting to me. Like, I would love to be able to, uh, to set up an entire propagation field in a natural reef. But then again, I have no idea how well that would go. Chances are it would be like a big learning curve. 52, the Starlight Chalice. We've been wanting to sell this guy for a long time, but we only had one left, so we, we finally got around to propagating it. So this is a little cutting from it. What kind of chalice would you say grows the fastest? Probably a Hollywood Stunner. Hollywood Stunner is like, we have plate-sized ones here. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Next up, 53. I missed the face hugger reference. Was there like a something that, that reminded you of a face hugger? Missed it. Oh, that's probably it. But yeah, starfish. Got a gold, a little bit lighter, a little bit more exposure. Aaron's Hobbs, I'm planning a trip to Japan and would like to go somewhere relating to this. Okay, so um, you were probably going to fly into Tokyo Narita Airport. Um, ah, yes, starfish on the glass climbing towards my face. Figures. Um, you're gonna fly into Tokyo Narita Airport, which is like an hour away from downtown Tokyo. Um, and here's the thing that people don't realize about Tokyo. Like you hear that Tokyo is a big city, right? There's big cities and then there's crazy big cities and then there's biggest city in the world, which is Tokyo. Now, um, one of the, to, to get to our downtown hotel, just to stay that night, uh, we had, you know, looked up all the different trains that we have to take. So I took like a, an express train from the airport to downtown. Lost my phone, which we talked about already. And then there's like this downtown loop. It's a very uh, historic 
line. It's called the Yamanote line. And it's, uh, it's important for one reason, that it basically just makes a circle, has 29 or 30 stops on it. And it separates, I guess, the main downtown from the rest of Tokyo. So inside the circle is like downtown, downtown Tokyo. It's so big that every single stop on the Yamanote line is almost its own city with its com own complete different culture. So for example, like um, Harajuku is one of the stops and that's like where all the little like weirdly dressed hipster style kids are all there. There's Akihabara, which is like the big electronics district. 54, Blue Lithophyllum. Um, there is Ginza, which is like the super high-end shopping district. Like, so if you, if you have like, you know, baller, one percenter money, like Ginza is your place. So every single stop on the Yamanote line is like, you could spend an entire day there. So with these 29 stops, you can spend literally an entire month just riding the Yamanote line, going to one stop every single day. Then you can look at the map of all the train routes in Japan. And the Yamanote line is this tiny little itty bitty ring and then the rest of the train lines spider out. And you just see just how expansive Tokyo must be. It's, you could spend multiple lifetimes just exploring Tokyo. It's, it's such a crazy, crazy big place. <clears throat> all right, next up. 55. It's a, another mean green chalice. I think this one might be slightly larger. Uh, ever tried Sangokai products? Ever not heard of them? Hey Lawson, what's up? <clears throat> so Lawson is the husband of Suzanne, who was uh, in Japan. He couldn't he couldn't make it to the trip with us. Unfortunately, he missed out. Missed out big time. Okay, next up, 56. Tricolor Blasto Welsi. So right now that whole crew, they're at um, they're in Detroit at a beer festival, I think, enjoying themselves. Well, I'm working. I'm working with you guys, so I don't know. Maybe they're they're still missing out. Yeah, pretty good. So, uh, yeah, we're... we're uh, so if you didn't already know, uh, like Lawson, who's this guy in, in chat right now, uh, he and I were roommates freshman year at Michigan, and we stayed in touch this whole time. He's with all of... Like, I think basically all of my friends live in Michigan. Um, like, they, they might have all moved away, then they all ended up moving back. And even my childhood friends from Akron, Ohio here, now live in Michigan because like um, my one buddy, his wife is now a professor at Michigan State University. So now he's over there. So like everybody is like gone to Michigan. So when I, uh, when I go visit, I kind of have to do this loop and just like kind of spend multiple nights at different people's homes. <laughs> All right, sorry, little side sidebar there. 57. This is a red and green Blasto Merletti. So I know that I had talked earlier about like how well corals handle light. Blastomusa don't. Blastomusa are very much a low light coral. I would never try this under high light. AT or AI Prime Plus T5 or ATI Power Module. I kind of like the all in oneness of the power module. I also like the build quality of the power module. Go blue, peeler of faces. Yeah, see, that's like fighting words around here. <laughs> like. Living in, living in Ohio, having gone to Michigan, it's like telling somebody that you're like a part of the Taliban. It's, it's like the, the worst thing that you can say. Like Ohio State fans just hate you forever. <clears throat> All right, so next up, number 58 is gonna be a red Blasto Merletti. Yeah, it might take a month just to scratch the surface of Tokyo. Like, yeah, and the thing is, the density of stuff in Tokyo is crazy. 
Like uh, we went to the to the fish market. It's called the Tsukiji Fish Market. It's like the biggest fish market in the world, and you know we we're just gonna go there for some sushi. And right before you hit the fish market, we're just like looking at this building, and like we did. It, it has like no labeling. There's like no signs of like you know what building is this. It's just this big building, and you look up like it's probably about 40, 50 stories tall, which is taller than any. Um, building in like any any city near here like Cleveland Columbus it's bigger than any of those just in terms of height but not only is it that tall it's like five city blocks wide it's this massive building and it doesn't stand out in the Tokyo skyline and not only does it not stand out in the Tokyo skyline but the Tokyo skyline goes in every direction forever seemingly like you can climb, like go up the Tokyo Tower, look out, and the horizon will still be skyscrapers, just like this gigantic building that would be like the centerpiece of most downtowns. Like it is so big, and in that single building might be 50 restaurants and stuff like that. There's like tons of stuff in all these places, so you can totally find insane numbers of like cool places to see and visit just within a, a downtown area. Uh, let's go to 59, a blue Pavona. So um, I don't know if you guys are like foodies or anything like that. Like I, I love food. I'm kind of res a little bit restricted these days because I don't eat a lot of beef or pork. But um, I, I used to be like a big time foodie and I would like go like try to like track down Michelin starred restaurants and things like that. Um, I've eaten at Suki Yabashi Jiro, so if you've watched that uh, show Jiro Dreams of Sushi, a couple years ago we actually, like my parents and I, went on that trip and we actually got to eat at Jiro's. So that's considered like the best sushi in the world, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I've eaten at Joao Robichon in Las Vegas and stuff, which is like a three-star Michelin restaurant, and, and that guy won like um, a prize for like the chef of the century. He's like a super influential French chef. Um, but in the city of Tokyo has like an ungodly number of Michelin starred restaurants. It's like 50 or something like that. It's, an, it's a crazy number. Um, in like just of the three starred Michelin restaurants, uh, there's like over a dozen, I'm sure. And to put that into perspective, New York City I think has four. And I think LA might have like two or three. Las Vegas has one, Chicago has one. So to have like one city out there that has like over a dozen is like completely insane. 60, number 60. It's an orange Pavona. Um, yeah, and as far as like cost, like a, a three-star Michelin restaurant like in the West here, it's like a lot of money. It's like, a, it's a fancy restaurant. But there's a three-star Michelin restaurant in the Skiji fish market called Sushi Dai. And it costs like $30 per person for a three-star Michelin meal, which is like con considered, you know, best in the world type stuff. And it's only like 30 something dollars, but there's no reservations. So people camp out three hours to get into this place. They start camping out at four in the morning to try to get into this, uh, into this restaurant, just to try it. <clears throat> Jose Rosado, there's no way I can study for my civil engineering finals now that your live show is on. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Next up, 61. It's a smaller orange Pavona. Should drop you some uh, Swedish fish or sour patches, yeah. Yeah, I have a banana. Actually, I'm trying to eat healthier. Um, and I usually don't eat uh, sugary snacks like that, but Robbie sometimes is a bad influence. Number 62, it's a green Pavona. So you can just kind of see in the, in the past few different Pavonas that we've shown you, just the difference in, in their shape. Like a lot of the other ones were encrusting. This one is kind of plate forming, but the, it forms vertical plates. In 63, which is probably our second rarest, is the free care Pavona. Our most rare was probably that, that blue one with the green rim that we, we saw first.
So, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to doing a, a bit more traveling because I am a, I, I like to, 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 to sample a lot of different foods and stuff like that. Um, and I'm really trying to somehow get a trip to Iceland. And I hear that they have like really weird stuff there, but I'm, I'm, I'm eager to try it. Actually, in a couple weeks, I think, um, I'm going with Lawson, Suzanne, um, and my two other friends, which I don't think uh, you guys have met, uh, Dave and Lisa, they were, so Lisa is the pharmaceutical chemist that I mentioned before when we were talking about the Triton method and all that. Um, so she's the pharmaceutical chemist. Dave, the husband, is an eye surgeon. And we all went to Michigan together. We're all going to be going down to uh, New Orleans and pigging out there and gaining a whole bunch of weight. But I also wanted, like I said, I want to go to, on a Scandinavian trip just to, to see like Sweden, Norway, Iceland, all that stuff. Um, I obviously want to go back to Asia. I want to go to Fiji. Uh, let's go to number 64, which is the purple pipe organ. Um, the other girl that was on the trip with us to, uh, to Okinawa, her name is Erica, and she's like some big time lawyer. <laughs> she, um, She's a monster, like straight up monster. So when I went to law school, my, my biggest concern was that I wouldn't be able to read at a high enough level. Like it's just not something that I did recreationally ever. Like I was pretty stupid. Like the, the, the extent of my reading was like comic book stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean I, I, I mean, I read like classics as a part of my coursework. You know, I read the stuff that you read in high school. I read like Dune, Lord of the Rings and stuff like that for fun. But I didn't read a ton, whereas like she, since growing up, read a ton. And I think that she had like a special aptitude for reading. So I read Lord of the Rings maybe after college, maybe. She read it in fourth grade. And she's been this voracious consumer of reading the, the entire, her entire life. And so when like law school came around, she could just power through 70 to 100 pages of reading per night and absorb it all. I could read all those same pages, but I would probably absorb every tenth word. Like, it was, it was a disaster. So uh, let's move on to 65. It's a wintergreen pipe organ coral. Um, so yeah, like I just remember um, like in class, people were talking about a case and just me thinking, are we even talking about the same case? Because what I read sounds nothing like what the heck you guys are talking about. And that was pretty much my experience throughout law school. I graduated super average, middle of the pack, which was kind of the idea. I wasn't really planning on being a lawyer. Middle of the pack. Uh, she graduated first in her class. And graduating first in your class from like a big law school is crazy. Like the amount of work and insanity that you have to deal with. Because it's kind of like in real life um, where you climb up like a professional ladder. Uh, the higher up you go, the more sociopaths you have to deal with. So, like, in the process of doing well in law school, that's when you get into, like, the crazy psychopaths that are trying to, like, sabotage you and backstab and stuff, which I didn't have to deal with because it's like me, I'm, like, I'm fodder. You know, I'm supposed to be middle of the pack. Everyone's supposed to step on my head to get to the top. I don't care. But at the very tip top is, like, super mega cutthroat. So she survived all that and came out on top. So she is, like, a monster. And, yeah, hopefully we can all get on vacation all these fun places. Long story short, we want to take more vacations. These little fun segues. Okay, next up, 66. Green Samakora. We'll need to get brighten that guy up. He's kind of underexposed. <clears throat> and out of curiosity, did chat die? Because I haven't seen a new post come up in a little while. Do I need to refresh my browser? So if you guys can still hear me, please type something into chat. Just say hello. I promise I won't ban you just for that. Okay. Next up, 67. As far as I can tell, it's still working. Hope so. No. <laughs> All right. Okay, 68. 
All right. Uh, yeah, both of these are yellow scrolls. So I call it a yellow scroll. It looks more like a purple scroll. So everybody's saying hello. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Like, it, it got, like, really, really quiet. I, like, looked over at Chad. Like, that hasn't moved in, like, as, since I started talking. It's like, has I, have I just been talking to myself this whole time? All right. Uh, let's go to the next set of tanks. Actually, while he moves, I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. And I'm back. Put the TG overlay up for us. Too late. I made it back too fast. Okay. So we are on the number 69 now, the, the Duncan. We had some Duncans earlier. This is a looks like a three polyp Duncan. Oh, by the way, this is why everybody likes my mom, okay? Because she trash talks so much about me. So the title of gardens right now, that's my mom. Um, <laughs> yeah, Suzanne was telling a story because like, because uh, well, Suzanne is actually one of the reasons why I went to law school. I was in business school at the time and she was like, you know, tossing around the idea of doing law school right out of, right out of undergrad. And she kind of convinced me to go to law school. And then she didn't go. Like, it, it, she didn't go for like a really long time. Um, I actually got my law degree like years before she even started law school. And so when she finished law school, you know, and, and, and you know, they, they all came and visited. And my mom was like so proud of her. It's like, you know, congratulations. You know, I'm so proud that you got your law degree, blah, blah, blah. And, and Suzanne was like, yeah. I mean, like, Van got his too. And my mom said, yeah, whatever. Like, he doesn't even use it, this loser. <laughs> so yeah, that's my mom right there. Okay, number 70, <clears throat> teal candy cane. All right, so 71 is a pinstripe. Eh, one, one of the polyps does not look all that happy about it. Actually, we, this is, we have it listed as a pinstripe. I think this is actually a cobalt because it doesn't have the, the amount of striping that I'm used to seeing. So I hear winter is coming tomorrow. Are you a Game of Thrones fan? I am a huge Game of Thrones fan. I'm super into it. Uh, we spent a lot of time on vacation talking about uh, Game of Thrones theories about who Jon Snow's uh, mother might be. I actually would be incredibly disappointed if it turns out to be Lyanna Stark, like everybody says, because that's like super duper straightforward and everybody could like kind of figure that out. So my, uh, my dark horse guess as to who Jon Snow's father or mother is, is Ashara Dane. So, mark it down. So on April 23rd, 2016, I'm calling it. Ashara Dane is the mother of Jon Snow. We should just do a Game of Thrones uh, podcast where we, like, all we talk about is like, not Coral at all. Maybe I have a live show going on in the background. I won't even make mention of what Corals are going on and just talk Game of Thrones for the entire three hours. I could totally do it. Is Jon Snow dead? Nope. Or he, if he did die, he's not going to stay dead. Uh, okay, let's move on to 72. 
Yeah. And the show I really want to talk about is Black Sails. Like, I like Black Sails more than I like Game of Thrones. But obviously Game of Thrones is like the 800-pound gorilla that's actually pretty awesome. So I could talk about Game of Thrones forever. <clears throat> no, I, 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 have, I have every confidence that that Jon Snow is going to be back in some form. So in chat, type who is your favorite Game of Thrones character? I, I'm, I have an idea of what I'm going to see, but I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to, as to who you guys like. Not necessarily who's going to, to be the last person standing, but just uh, your, your personal favorite. John Galt, 26, Game of Thrones. <clears throat> Talk about Game of Thrones. Okay, let's move on. Uh, 73, Forest Green Acro. Did die? <laughs> okay. Is it because it's hitting the end, or is it because uh, like the power is not properly pushed in. <clears throat> Tyrion, Tyrion. Lyanna Stark. <laughs> Very funny. And what's up with all the Dune references? Oh, is it because I, I mentioned Dune the one time? <laughs> oh, must be. We can talk about Dune all day, too. I didn't make it very far past God Emperor, though. To me, that was like... I think, I think uh, they stuck the landing with that book, and after that, it kind of lost its way a little bit. So I, I didn't make it much further. And I read parts of, like, Chapter House and stuff. I'm like, I don't really know where they're going with all this. Like, I think that they could have, like, wrapped it up at the end of God Emperor of Dune. <clears throat> Okay, next up, 74, there's a Booberry Acropora. And you can lighten these guys up a little bit. They're, they seem a little bit dark on stream. I'm surprised, so, so far, no love for uh, the Martells. Yep, it's Acro time. There's a whole bunch of, uh, oh, at least a dozen more of these. 75. As far as I, as I'm concerned, like these are the most challenging um, of the stony corals that we have here. They require the highest light, highest flow, are, most, are the most sensitive. In Okinawa, they're completely exposed during low tide, getting rained on with fresh water, and they're fine. So, yeah, take it for what it's worth, I guess. And, and nobody likes the Boltons, I guess. Is that what I'm also gathering? No Roos Bolton fans. Okay, next up, 76. There's a forest green acro. Do you have a favorite character? Actually, do you watch Game of Thrones? You do, right? I do not. I, uh, Whoa. Michael does, is not a fan of Game of Thrones. Wow. Wow. Alright, 77. Purple Acropora Millipora. So the millipore tend to be like the furriest. <clears throat> so actually in this upcoming season, I know that a lot of people are looking forward to um, a lot of the stuff with the Ironborn in Game of Thrones. Because that's like a storyline that was almost completely, well, was completely omitted in, um, 
in this last season, I think season six, is it five or six? I forget. But um, there's like this big political thing where they're trying to select a new king amongst the Ironborn, and there's like a lot of really interesting characters that they haven't introduced, but they had they had casted them for this upcoming season. So I'm um, I'm really excited to see you know, what they do with like Euron Greyjoy, who's like the uncle of Theon. Okay, next up, 78. This is another blueberry. You can see a lot of different blueberry acroporas. You can see a lot of different um, emeralds or the, the green guys. You'll see some um, some frog skin, stuff like that. I never watch Game of Thrones. I prefer to watch Title Guards videos. Thank you. But seriously, watch Game of Thrones. It's, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. All right, next up, 79. So, yeah, jellyfish. I never really considered getting jellyfish because a lot of the, um, the, the home aquarium sized uh, displays are, they, they kind of reminded me of like goldfish tanks, you know? Where it's kind of like this little novelty, probably not that great at keeping the animal alive sort of thing. So I, I kind of hesitated because of that. But I, I did see that there's like some manufacturers that are making some really big ones, like almost um, use like a public aquarium sized things for homes. So something like that I would consider. Um, but then again, it might not be the best idea. So let's go on to number 80. I'll tell you why in a sec. Okay, so I was thinking that it would be cool, except that the price is very high. I think that they're currently about like $3,000, which is not that bad considering a tank of that size in acrylic with filtration, lighting, all that stuff, it's probably gonna be $3,000. Not a problem with the price, but that's just a lot of money for me anyway. Um, the other problem is, it's like I have cats, and I love my cats. But one cat in particular is incredibly destructive. Like, my, uh, my laptop here doesn't have one of those glossy screens. It has a matte screen, and she hopped up onto the keyboard because she loves to like sit on these keys, right? And she just like scratched the heck out of my laptop screen. So I have all these really fine little scratches going up and down all across my, my screen here, thanks to my little kitty cat, Penny. So I can just imagine her doing that to a giant $3,000 acrylic tank, too. And that kind of kind of <laughs> makes me sour towards that. All right, number 81. It's a green Slimer Acro. These guys need more light than we're giving it. They should be a lot brighter green. Um, so... Yeah, to give you an idea of how destructive this cat is, I have like a, a sofa that's like partly leather and the leather portion is completely flayed. And she did all this damage in like under a year. <clears throat> Would you be able to do a DIY jellyfish tank? Probably not very well. They need to be a specific design to keep the water circulating in, a, in like a circular motion to keep it from to keep the jellyfish from hitting the sides. So that would be the most challenging part. Number 82, frog skin acro. They make acrylic tanks with starfire glass fronts now. Hmm, that's an interesting idea. Definitely get a dog. Dogs are too much maintenance. Uh, you know what, it's not that I dislike dogs. In fact, I, I get dogs obviously a lot more than I get cats. Like, my cats, I get fish and coral more than I get my cats. You know like uh, if, if you ever have cats, you, you can't point stuff out to them. You know, you point at something and they just stare at the tip of your finger. Like, they just have a completely different 
language that you just never speak or something. It's it's like the strangest thing. Dogs are, are super intuitive as to what they want at any given time. My cats, it, it's hard to tell what they want. I have no idea. Next up, 83. It's a blueberry acro. And sorry, there's no shipping to Canada. Only the US. Yeah, but like, uh, I, I would feel bad if I had a dog and just wasn't able to give it the time necessary. Like, to be perfectly honest, I feel like I don't give my cats enough attention. Like, I should play with them for 15 minutes a day so they can get out all that kitty energy to, like, stop scratching and destroying everything. But I don't even sometimes get that. So occasionally, um, like, when I'm printing out my shipping labels and stuff, like, my cats will just be, like, jumping all over me. So um, I'll ask one of, like, my guys, like part of their job is could you just play with these cats for 15 minutes while I print out shipping labels like that's totally a thing that happens around here can you play with my cats for money all right next up 84 in the sec it's a forest green acro Upside down jellyfish gets boring fast. Yeah, I probably agree with that. And I, I think I mentioned it in my um, public aquarium video from Okinawa that one of the things that I would really like to see is a lot more of the bioluminescent jellyfish. I mean, those are really, really cool. Like the one that, uh, that I kind of showed in that video um, has like, you know, like tentacle, like weird tentacles and stuff like that that are moving. Like that thing was like sweet. I, 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 if I had a jellyfish tank full of stuff like that, it would be way cooler. <clears throat> Cats are 50% 50, 50 a-holes, probably. Sounds about right. Okay. So that guy was the forest green. And let's move on to 85. It's a blue Acropora Taraki. Yeah, whale sharks, you know, I kind of struggle with, uh, with keeping those things in captivity because even though that, that tank was like a two million gallon tank, one of the biggest in the world, it looked really small when you put whale sharks in it. And that's like, I don't think anybody really needs to see a whale shark in a tank. Watch a video or something. I mean. It's, it's cool in concept, and, and, but in practice, it's like, it would be better if this tank was 10 times the size. I get that feeling about, you know, keeping, you know, like yellow tanks and 10 gallon tanks. It's like, ugh, it doesn't look quite right. But, you know, is there any tank that's gonna be good for a whale shark? I'm thinking probably not. I mean, they're, they're, they're huge, they're like 50 feet long. Um, yeah, so the, the Georgia Aquarium is three times the size, and so I am kind of curious to see you know, how they look there. But um, like, as far as your survival rate, it's really, really poor. They die a lot. Like, they die really quickly. I'm new to reefing. Do corals produce any bio load to a tank, and can you add numerous corals to a tank all at once, or will that change my own? Um, you might not want to add them all at once, but it's not necessarily a bio load thing. Um, it's more of a, if your tank really wasn't ready for coral and you add in a bunch of coral and then all the coral die, that would be bad. Um, their contribution to bio load is pretty minimal compared to fish. So if you wanted to add like five to 10 corals, it's probably not a big deal. Like I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, number 86, purple bonsai acro. These guys have green polyps, so it's kind of hard to see on stream, but um, if you hit it with just, just pure actinic light, that base turns almost black, and the bright, bright green polyps start fluorescing. Rastazoas in the lineup, yes. It, not, it might not be for, for a while, though. We're not doing uh, zoas until the very end, so closer into that late hundreds. Mm -hmm. Next up, 87, green Pasilopora. Yeah, when it comes to cats, I totally spoil mine. I'm like crazy cat person over here. 
Like they put cat shelves up. They all have like robot toilets and stuff. Totally spoiled kitty cats. And then they still take time to scratch and bite me. Okay, next up, 88. This is a pink pastelopora. How big would you say that is? Maybe like one to two inches at the most? We have a bunch of these, so there's 10 of these available. So anytime you see like $10, X10, it's not, doesn't mean 100. It means there's 10 available at that price. Jay Raker and John Gold. Yeah, that's that's actually really good advice about like adding in a bunch of corals, is that they can deplete um, like essential elements and macro elements like really quickly. Water change. 89. Pink stylo. Came in late. Did you do Monty's already? No. Actually, you're coming in at the perfect time because within about 10 corals, we're going to do an entire series on Montipora. Monier. Alright, see you Louise. Thanks for coming. Alright, number 90. Neon Green Stylo. So the last live sale, uh, I pretty much lost my voice the day after. I can already feel that coming on now. And we're not even halfway through this. All right, 91. I've been at Chatterbox, just telling all kinds of stories and stuff. I think you need some Jack Daniels and Coke to make this all better. <laughs> So larger uh, neon green stylo there. Next up, purple pasilopora. I don't know if these things are really that different than pink pasilopora, but you can kind of see the pink and the purple next to each other. So it does have a different color, tips are brighter, things like that. Um, oh, so yeah, I still maintain that I really don't drink that much, right? On vacation though, um, we were trying a bunch of different stuff. Because um, one of our people in our group of friends, he, he was living in Europe for like, the longest time, and he's like a total you know, whiskey connoisseur. And But he even said, don't go out of your way to buy whiskey in Japan. Uh, let's go to number 93, which is that pink pasta pour. It's $5. If you want to give it a try, if you want to give SPS a try and have five bucks laying around, there you go. Um, So he suggested not getting whiskey in Japan, even though um, Yamazaki, I believe that's the name of the, the distillery in Osaka, Japan, this past year had the highest rated whiskey in the world. It was like the first time ever that it wasn't from like Scotland or something, but it was actually a Japanese whiskey that won the award for like, you know, for the best uh, single malt whiskey in the world. Um, but you can get that in the United States pretty pretty easily. Like Yamazaki is like a big distillery; it's a big deal. But you cannot get really good sake in the U.S. Uh, let's go to number ninety-four. It's a yellow bird's nest. And so he suggested if you're going to buy any alcohol and bring it back to the U.S., yeah, that's way out of focus. There we go, much better. Um, definitely try to get the really good sake. And so. We did some like you know Wikipedia type searches on stuff like the different grades of sake, and um, when we were leaving, you know, just hitting the duty freeze, they actually have samples of all this stuff. You know, they, they want you to buy bottles. So I tried some of like the, the the nicer, higher end sake, and yeah, it is a completely different animal than the stuff that you would just get at a Japanese restaurant here in the states, like. It tasted like a different drink altogether because I'm not I'm not a big sake fan at all. Like I don't I drink it maybe like once every three years or something. It's never really been my taste, but that stuff a lot better. Okay, next up number ninety five. It's a pink bird's nest. You can't get the twenty five year Yamazaki. 
Huh. Interesting. And I have not tried Choya. Or maybe I have. Maybe I have. I just don't remember it. It's not something that I would have ordered recently. Number 96, Bird of Paradise. Yeah, I figured you can get the 12 and 18 year, because I've seen that before. But, huh, the 25 you can't, I guess. Yeah, Dana, I heard that um, that the Great Barrier Reef is going under a lot of pressure with uh, with bleaching issues and stuff like that. Number 97, Purple Sand Dollar Monty. So yeah, we have like a long string of Montipora. So pay attention to the fact that like some of them are encrusting, like this Purple Sand Dollar. Some of them will be branching and some of them will be plating. So if you're kind of looking for anything um, in particular, it, sh it should be labeled, but if it's not, um, I'll try to point it out. Any growth pattern in particular, I should say. It's actually a shame that a lot of the really nice reefs in the world are are dying pretty substantially. Like I guess like Okinawa even isn't what it used to be, you know, back in like the 90s and stuff. Okay, next up, 98. It's, this is an Indata. It's kind of like a, like a mossy green color, purple polyps. Luckily, even if you're late, it's still good. There's still, uh, you can still watch the, the entire thing over and there's probably gonna be plenty of stuff still available. This, the live show goes on for a couple of days after the fact. And depending on how lazy I am, even as late as Thursday. It says 72 hours guaranteed. After that, that's when I get around to it. Okay. We only have two more. Uh, nope, never mind. I'm, I'm full of it. We're going to go on to number 99 in a moment here. This can be a purple plating Montipora. I um, am really interested in the idea of doing more with coral farming. Like the, the corals that have done best here, for example, clearly have been the ones that we've been growing forever. If we're ever going to have problems, it's usually with corals that have been imported recently and haven't really adjusted to aquarium life. You know, the ones that, are, that have been propagated over years, they're like practically bulletproof. So I would love to have more stuff that we could sustainably propagate. And it just makes good business, really. It's not even uh, so much a, uh, an environmental thing, but obviously there's that aspect too. But just, like, this stuff does the best here. It doesn't keep dying like some of this other stuff does. All right, let's go to number 100. This is an encrusting green Monty. Probably the weirdest of all of my Montipora. Not really sure exactly, uh, even if it is a Monty sometimes, because it has like sweeper tentacles and stuff, unlike just about every other Monty. And our friend the Glare has returned. I think it might also just because of, well, number one, I'm 100% I'm sure. It is the lens. Going back to our little lens issue, it's the lens. Um, so it's catching in a lot more of the reflection. And number two, it is a bright sunny day today, so a lot more reflections are popping up on the glass. All right, 101. It's a Montipora spongodes. They want to shut down our farm too. They do. 
Okay, next up, 102. Eh, that one's gonna be really, really hard to see, even if it was in focus. It's a poker star, green polyps, purple base. I wanna Google search that one because it's not really showing up on stream. It's, it's kind of small. All right, move on, 103, purple haze, Montipora. This guy's itty bitty tiny. They grow pretty quickly though. And uh, it, it's probably not getting as much light as it probably needs. Um, when we, we actually get this from a local hobbyist and uh, he grows his under um, 400 watt metal halides, some radiums. So yeah, that's gonna make a big difference in color. Wireless, how are you doing, Dan? I'm doing well. I had some, some whiny stories at the beginning, but we're over it. Next up, 104, German Blue Montipora Digitata. So this is actually uh, a branching variety. So it looks like it's encrusting. It'll send up um, some individual branches. Next up, 105. This is a rainbow Monty. These guys strangely have colored up a lot better lately. So you actually just keep that uh, fluorescent on there so you can see all the different colors popping up. That is definitely my favorite Montipora. Okay, next up. 106 is a sunset Montifora. Okay, moving on 107. It's an orange plating. So, as far as Montipora go, I haven't seen any that um, you can provide too much light to. They really can soak it all in and they get very, very, very bright and colorful. So, a lot of these guys do look pretty good, but I'm telling you, like, they're absolute peak coloration under, like, really intense metal halides, things of that sort. It's a very, it's a different level than what you're seeing here, even. Okay, next up, 108. It's a green plating. Okay, moving on 109. It's a scarlet. This is an encrusting variety here. I have a calming voice. Thank you. I'm about to lose my voice shortly here. Actually, can you grab me um, uh, yeah, another one of the waters? I'm not used to talking this much. Like I live at home. Like I'm a, I'm a hermit. I just sit and just stare at my cats as they stare at me. Super antisocial. Watching Game of Thrones alone. So then I have to like do a show like this where I talk for three hours straight. Okay, 110. This is a Montipor Satosa. This is a branching variety, but it has a curious growth pattern because the um, it forms like little knobs sometimes and also um, it's very, the polyps are very widely spaced apart. So it has a very different appearance than a lot of these other ones. What are the white things on the Scarlet Monty? Can you scroll back to the Scarlet? Um, it could just be mesenterial filaments. So like if it's uh, if it caught some food or something like that, sometimes it like uh, brings basically its guts to the surface to, di to help digest and stuff like that. All right, let's move on to 111, which is the uh, red plating Montipora. And we are actually going to be at our intermission here, so everyone can take a quick break.
You can see our, uh, our fox face there, thinking that he's about to get fed. That fish always worried me a little bit because he's super tame. You can practically pet him like a dog, and you don't want to be doing that with uh, fox faces because they're venomous. <clears throat> what happened to the beer? Yeah, it's pretty much I only drink when, um, when I'm being like peer pressured. Okay, so we will move on. Uh, we'll start back up at 112. Uh, I will say a quick shout out once again to the Patreon folks. Thank you so much for your contributions. There's actually a bunch more that just are doing like the $1 thing. Um, and obviously, very, very cool too. This, these are the, the $5 patrons, $5 and up per month. So thank you all very much. Uh, they get some perks. And speaking of drinking, um, if we hit the $100 uh, subscription level, um, I want to do a show where we do basically an absinthe tasting here. And I'll, I'll get the, the whole fountain and the spoons with the sugar and all that. We'll, 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 we'll make it a, a good, honest effort to do it right. I was hoping to get it done by my birthday, but that looks like it's kind of ambitious. So my birthday is coming up in June here. So um, there's an outside chance that we'll do a live show for my birthday. We'll see. We'll see if that's going to be a thing. But the, but the gang will be here visiting, and um, it'll be a good time. So yeah, like the I guess like the the really good stuff you have to import from like either France or Switzerland or something like that. That's made with the actual wormwood, because um, I guess there's like a bunch of different types of, of um, absinthe you can get. But the really 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 good stuff tends to be um, kind of more difficult to track down. But if, like I said, if I hit that hundred dollar price point or the d donation point, um, we'll get that party cranking. <laughs> Okay. Shout out from C T A R S. What is that? C T A R S. Does that sound familiar to you? Let me Google that real fast. That's actually a good guess. Let me see. C T A R S. Connecticut Area Reef Society. Very good. There you go. Good guess. <laughs> Where's the birthday bash going to be at? It's going to be at my house because I don't ever leave my house. I'm a hermit. <laughs> I've mentioned that like a few times. Like, I, I joke about that, but seriously, I don't get out much. Obviously. Because people that get out a lot don't set up like coral reef greenhouses and stuff. They, I don't know what they do. They play football or something. Have you kicked anyone off today for being rude? Um, I don't know if he's rude, but I did. But then again, it's like after the start that this day had, um, I have a remarkably short fuse, I guess. <laughs> so any slight borderline thing, I'm booting. I'm, I'm just zero tolerance booting everybody. <laughs> no, generally speaking, people have been good. Like after um, after the Halloween show, where. Uh, basically Suzanne cut everybody's heads off um, there's been only like maybe like one or two per show and it's like somebody that that's new that just has like no idea and they probably come from like twitch where it's like perfectly acceptable to troll hardcore the entire stream all the time here it's like mm, no like part of my fun is banning people so I kind of have like a hair trigger when it comes to that and I tell Robbie who unfortunately he's not here he had a death in the family so he's at a funeral right now but um, yeah, I tell Robbie, it's like, dude, ban more people. Like that, guy, there's no reason why that guy should have been able to have five more responses in chat. Like, get rid of that guy. But he's like, I, I you know, he, he watches so many uh, video game streams on Twitch that he's just like, that's like nothing, uh, you know, compared to. And I'm like, I know, I get it, I get it. This isn't Twitch. You know, we we have a, we have a body count. That, we, that we're, we're very proud of here. 
Yeah, no, no comedians. Just am amateur night at the improv is not going to work today. What are your thoughts on Linkia and Fromia starfish? I like them. Um, I think you need like a really large system to keep them happy long term. Um, the longest we've ever kept one alive is probably a year and a half. Kids these days, and the thing is, like, and, I, and I've mentioned it before in other streams and other videos. Like, I get trolling. Like, I think it's really funny. Even, um, it's just for for this particular show, it doesn't quite work out so well. Because um, you, you also have to know your audience. Like, I mean, I'll, I'll let you know in a little secret. Okay. By the way, if you if you're curious as to like why we're taking this little intermission is because like other people have to use the bathroom so okay so a little story uh or a little personal anecdote i swear a lot like it, it, like my friends who know me like every other word out of my mouth is probably a curse word but have you ever heard me swear on stream or in my videos no and it's probably a good thing because like i've the longer i've done this it turns out that I have a lot of like children and stuff that watch my stream, and like and you know they they are the ones that are actually the ones interested in the hobby, and they kind of like drag their parents and stuff into this, and you know like for their sakes, it's probably a good thing that I'm not swearing all the time, which if I had like a video game stream, every other word would be cursing, because that's how I talk, <laughs> so. It, it, it kind of, so chat kind of has to be appropriate for like my greater audience, even though personally I get it. And honestly, I'm probably 10 times worse than the worst troller on here, which says a lot because I've had the KKK and ISIS troll this chat. <clears throat> All right. What's the difference between Ocellaris and Percula? Uh, they look similar, but they're actually uh, different species. It's difficult to find like a true Percula or anything like that these days. Okay, so Michael's back, and this is a Pseudocornactus, a very um, effective fish predator. It's a type of a mushroom. Healer of faces. I used to stream on Twitch, got trolled every day. Yep, that sounds about right. They should troll you every minute of every day. I can't imagine Than cursing like a sailor. Believe it. <laughs> 113. This is a strawberry pseudocoronactus. This guy, little guy came as a hitchhiker. I think these might be Caribbean in, in origin. I'm not really sure. But they typically stay small. They like dark air areas. And also my brand of humor is extremely inappropriate. Like typically not like sexual stuff, but like, uh, there's a reason why I don't get offended when people make racist uh, statements in my direction. Cause I do find a lot of that stuff hilarious, so there you go. We made a lot of fun of how foreign we were in Japan, like from the perspective of native Japanese people calling us stupid. Stupid gaijin. All right, next up, 114. This is a blue and green sympodium. It's a pretty fast growing uh, soft coral. We've been propagating this for a really long time. Is coralline algae only pink and purple? No, there's all different types. Um, it, it, a lot of it is very light dependent as to which ones are gonna grow well because certain ones, um, as soon as they get a little bit too much light, they die almost instantly. 
Others only grow in like the really, really, really bright light. So those tend to be like more rust colored. Um, you can actually even get them like in bright yellows and like bright orange and stuff. You can also get like what looks like bioluminescent ones. Um, like we have red uh, coralline algae that grows on like the side of our tubs in low light. And at night it actually fluoresces red. I don't know, I guess that's not really bioluminescence, but it's fluorescence. <clears throat> One fifteen. This is a green Florida recordium. We're pretty much out of recordium. We haven't purchased any in so long, and uh, we're kind of like slacking on our propagation of mushrooms in general. Vacations kind of do that, get you all thrown off your pace. I have some podium. Any other colors? I've only seen blues and greens. I haven't really seen any other color. All right, 116. Orange Recordia, Florida. What is brackish water? Can a bubble tip survive in brackish? No. Brackish water is like, um, if you can imagine like, a river emptying out into an ocean where like the salt water and fresh water are mixing, that's brackish. Um, a lot of things do live in brackish water, but I wouldn't trust a, a bubble tip anemone to live in something like that. Um, having said that, I posted this article from The Guardian in, um, on my Facebook page, but you can just do like a, a search for it. But basically, um, at the mouth of the Amazon River, where all of that fresh water from like the world's largest river empties out into the Atlantic, uh, it created like the you know like a huge uh, kick up of dust and sediment, and that place was um, opened up for um, like oil and gas mining. Um, but the, what they found was under all of that cloudiness and silt and whatever. There's actually a gigantic 250 mile long coral reef. And I have no idea what types of coral are living there, but it's, it's surprising that in those conditions there are corals at all. 117, it's a blue Florida recordia, if you couldn't already guess. Will Caribbean anemones host clownfish? Not usually. Uh, but clownfish are so goofy these days that they might host in anything. So it really, they're not supposed to, but they might. Uh, Howard, late to the show, have I missed Acros and Montes? Yes, but you haven't missed them by much. So if you scroll back to about uh, 90 to 110, you'll see them all. Uh, 118. <clears throat> Green striped discosoma. What is the salinity of brackish? I'm not really sure. It's probably like one point zero one, maybe a little bit less than that. One point zero zero nine. I think it depends. Next up, 119. One time um, I was in Mexico and there's like this ecological park there called, uh, I'm forgetting. It's not Ishkaret, it's, nope, old age, forgot. But they have this snorkeling thing where like, it's, it's so cool because they, they drive you with all your snorkeling gear and stuff like that to the basically the, the mouth of a cenote, which is like an underwater river to where it kind of starts. And so you hop in in fresh water. And it's really cool because you just jump right in and you're basically in what looks like a rainforest. No, you're literally in a rainforest. Rainforest river. And you see all like the freshwater fish and stuff. And as you swim down this freshwater river, it slowly starts turning into salt water. So then you see like the brackish water stuff. And there's like the upside down jellyfish and things of that sort. Let's move to 120. Um, 
and so you start to see like all the brackish water stuff and even you see like like a um, like blue Caribbean tangs and stuff like that in the brackish water and you see all the different activities that they have going on like uh, like throughout the entire thing because they have like different stations for like cliff diving and stuff like that and um, there's all types of, of different fun stuff along the, the, the river and and finally you get to the ocean so that's like a kind of like a cool experience and maybe one of these days I'll if I ever go back to Mexico um, I'll have to shoot that just to, just to show you what that's like because it, it's really um, interesting to see just the progression of, of I guess like all the different types of life going over the course of like a one mile snorkeling trip see ya another one band <laughs> next up 121 Uh, when I click on the item, I don't see the specimen. No, there really isn't a way to see it. You kind of have just to look at the stream. Hey, Luke. Glad you could make it. That's funny. It's like it's it's you, you know it's bad when like when other people in chat are. Uh, or calling out people to ban. It's funny. All right, next up, 122. Marble Discosoma. No, it wasn't there. Um, it, it was. It's in Riviera Maya. Um, hmm. Not sure. I can't believe I forgot what it's called though. It's gonna bug me. 123. What eats red slime? Nothing really. Um, the, the easiest way that I've ever dealt with it is just to like make sure that your water chemistry is, is all right. Um, you know, keep up on all the on all your chemistry water changes. Um, direct siphoning will help momentarily, but it really boils down to a chemical thing. Um, you know, make sure your skimmer's running properly. Um, make sure you don't have like crazy high phosphates or nitrates. Have I missed the Acans too? Yes, Howard. Uh, so Acans were roughly 60s, no, 70s, something like that. Is it okay to keep a salinity of 1.017 for a reef? That's pretty low. Probably not. Um, okay, so next up, 24 Golden Discosoma. On stream, it looks like purple, but. It fluoresces like a bright, bright orange gold color. Yeah, everybody gets a water change. Seriously, that's that's the only way that I've ever found that reliably deals with it, other than like heavy chemical filtration, which is another option that I guess that works. Uh, a few months ago, you had an interstellar mushroom. Any chance you'll have it again? Not for a while. Um, we're like really low on those. We need to propagate those because I don't know if I'll ever see those again. They sell out like anytime we offer them, they sell within a few like hours of us putting putting it up there. Wake, greetings from Guatemala. Welcome. Actually, I want to visit Guatemala one of these days. So the entire uh, area of that of the Caribbean, going from like Mexico all the way down south. Every single place seems to be very different, so I, I wanted to try to see all the different places. 125, yellow rim rhodactus. So it, this is a green rhodactus, but the, um, but the rim fluoresces a bright yellow and directinic. Luke, I really like the non-zoomed in sail, helps with the mental size of each. I don't like it, but we're stuck with it because okay. So for for those of you that didn't um, that didn't hear from the beginning of the show when I was whining, um, there's a reason why it's zoomed out like this. The the lens that I had taken on vacation um, is basically stuck on this camera, 
So the correct lens is like a macro lens that gives you a much tighter focus. Uh, I can't physically remove this current lens off. Like it's just stuck on there. Like the button doesn't work, it's just jammed. And so I looked online to, to see how I might be able to remove it. Um, let's go to 126. It should be a Superman Redactus, and it is. So I saw a YouTube video and somebody said, you can just force it off. But their lens was plastic. And so they were basically just breaking the plastic off. Because it's a cheap lens, like 50 to to $100, who cares? My lenses has like a metal mount. So I'm not gonna rip off a metal mount off of it. So I'm gonna have to take this whole camera with lens, send it to Canon and have them fix it for me. So that's why you're seeing this, this different perspective of stuff. Don't know if you answered this already, but how's the progress on the clan project? It's getting there. Um, we're still slowly plumbing that system. Uh, in my latest video that I just put up just yesterday, it was kind of like a walk around for the Patreon folks, but I accidentally just put it out there for everybody to see and I just left it. Um, in there, you can see the tank that, that's gonna have the clamps. I need to build up the substrate. I need to get different lighting. And I want to experiment with putting um, a really strong metal halide system on a rail to have it like be motorized to go back and forth over the course of the day. That'll save me from having to put three metal halides on the tank, for example. How did the lens break? Yeah, I don't really know. Like, it was fine. And then suddenly, like, when I went to, like, switch lenses today, it was like, uh-oh. No, nothing of the sort. And these things you don't really want to mess with that bad because, like, like every single lens that I have is probably, like, over $1,000. So you don't really want to be breaking these things. I'll just let the pros do what they do and fix my camera. Uh, have you ever kept fresh water? The last time I did fresh water, I was probably 13 or something like that. It's a long, long time ago. Okay, so this guy is the red marbled redactus. A lot of it looks purple under this type of lighting, but the highlights are red. Are there any color variations of star polyps? There's, the only ones I've ever seen are green and brown. Uh, Neil, any scalemia? No. We only have one scalemia and it's just about to die. Can we put rock salt or marine salt or is it compulsory marine salt? I would use an, a salt specifically made for reef tanks because it's not just salt water. It's, there's a lot of chemistry that goes into it. If that's, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Okay, let's go on to number 128. Will there be any more LPS? Uh, yeah, I think there will be. And I think that um, the, the Favia Favites are coming up. Okay, 129. So these candy stripe discosomas, they, um, they fluoresce more of an orange underneath, so... The view that we're getting now does seem a lot more purple than I'm used to seeing like with my bare eye, naked eye. I will soon be moving and building a new tank. I would love TG to make a profile tank when done. That'd be cool. Any chance for anemones? That's on me. Um, there's not gonna be, uh, but in the future I need to find a good way to just uh, display the anemones that I plan to, to do for the live sale and just like have a little short video of them and talk about them because if I actually put them on these racks like this for the live sale they'll move by the time that the live sale is happening okay 130 uh, toadstool leathers Evan, have you ever been to a Blue Jackets game? I have not. I'm not the biggest um, hockey fan in the world. And I know that it's not for me because when I was an undergrad, um, I was at the University of Michigan at a time when um, that team was winning national, champion, national championships. And um, I was in my English class with the goalie at the time who went on to like the NHL 
and was playing for the Dallas Stars for a long time. And also the Red Wings, the Detroit professional team, was also winning the Stanley Cup. Like, I think two of the four years I was at Michigan. So, oh, and my roommate was one of the managers of the Michigan hockey team, and he could get us free tickets whenever we wanted to the press box. And I went to a few live games. It was a, an amazing experience, and I really just never got into hockey. So, yeah, when it comes to, like, hockey, it's never been a sport for me. I gave it a chance, though. I really did. Next up, 131. All right, see you, Lawson. Um, we'll, 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 we'll touch base, but if not, I'll see you in New Orleans at some point. Okay, next up, 132. Neon Green Eftia. And 133 is a larger Neon Green Eftia. So Fong Lei is asking, how do you get rid of these guys? 134, which is a, a green star polyp. We have two types. There's the same rough color scheme uh, with the neon green, but um, you can see how like the one looks kind of feathery. The other one has a balloon center, which is 135. The one on the left is the balloon uh, centered green star polyp. It has a big white center. Yeah, I would just go and razor blade it off. It comes off pretty easily. Um, one thing that I'll address in one of my videos is just some really practical, helpful tools to have around that aren't obviously made for the reef aquariums that you should kind of have. And one is a wood carving set. A lot of those tools are like perfect for working um, in and around corals. Poser, I'm planning on starting an SPS dominated bare bottom tank. I think covering the bottom with different types of zoas is possible without subject. Your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, my buddy that had the 240 gallon tank, we were talking about doing something like that. Um, and he was, um, he had started to, to, to glue that stuff down, but um, then he quit the hobby. So he took the tank down. So we never actually fully executed it. But it's an interesting concept, it's certainly worth a try. You'd have to like provide a lot of flow to kick up all the detritus all the time so nothing really settles on the corals. Okay, next up, 136. This is a Kenya tree. In theory, because I, I like people in chat are talking about like uh, invasive species of corals. If you're doing this hobby right, all of your corals should be invasive species. That's kind of what they're trying to do. And if you're helping them out, things are going well. But yes, pruning them back is, is necessary sometimes. Next up, 137. So I never look at like stuff going crazy as a bad thing. It's always a positive. It's more work, but it's always a positive. You're doing the right thing. So this is a green lobophytum. It's actually uh, from Australia, and then sometimes they're called a crown leather. Um, they have bright fluorescent green tips, or tentacles, on their polyps. Okay, next up, 138. Pulsing Xenia, speaking of stuff that can grow rampant. Thomas Stolberg, hello from Australia. Hello to you too. Okay. 139 is a first of our two blue ridges. So 139 is $20. 140 is a smaller one for $15. Uh, these guys are are very very fast growing in, in fact we have like a, an entire egg crate that's just them we don't really know what to do with it because it's kind of it's kind of a, a weird shape so we can't really sell it and it's like a, a two by two sheet of egg crate very very bizarre excuse me <clears throat> okay 141 in a moment. So I will put this up just momentarily 
the rules for those that are lost and don't know what's going on. And I'm gonna run to the restroom real quick. Be right back. I'm back. Okay, so my mom just said that somebody had asked about um, whether you can just use salt water from the ocean directly into your tank. I think it is possible, but um, even the places that do it run it through some sort of filtration before using it, and they also take it from really far out, not like really close to shore. I don't see the, the thing in chat, but assuming that was the question, that's the answer. I'd love to be able to do that. Um, the, the aquariums that I've seen that do that have a very different look when it comes to their invert systems. Okay, so I think we were on 141. Yes. This is a Galaxia. It's a small uh, stony coral, and you can see that it's got a little sweeper, sweeper tentacle there. That's like the big issue with these guys. They tend to uh, be rather aggressive but their appearance is very attractive. So if you can just give it enough space, that's probably the biggest key for these. They're, they're, they're tough otherwise. <clears throat> and there's five of those available for $15. My elegance isn't opening up. Um, I don't know, is it an Australian elegance? Because typically the Australian ones don't run into infection issues, but um, if it's an Indonesian one, sometimes it can get infected and start closing like that. Yeah, D from Brooklyn. Even if you get really good water, the pathogens come in as well. That's true. Um, I would, like, I heard that when it comes in, um, when, they, when they bring it in, they, I heard they bleach the heck out of it too, stuff like that. And after like a couple days, the bleach dissipates and it's sterilized and then they use it. Could be wrong, but I've heard. Heard rumor of. Next up, 142, it's a pink cabbage leather. Who works harder in the greenhouse, you or mom? I'm guessing mom, probably my mom. All right, next up, 143, neon green cabbage. Best way to remove a leather from a rock. That's a toughie. You might want to chisel it right out. It kind of depends. Hammer and chisel is another really helpful tool. Okay, next up, 144. So we went over some Leptoceruses before. There's a couple stragglers that we just tossed up here. Okay, 145 is a green Spartan Leptosiris. Leptosiris, Leptosiris. Evan Harvey, do you own Tyler Gardens? Yes.
Okay, next up, 146. It's a small little green Ganyapura. Um, Ganyapura have like a really, really bad reputation for survival, but this one in particular has grown well for us, like for years, and we've been propagating it. Um, others tend to not do that well. So sometimes the pink ones do pretty well, but we haven't purchased a pink one in a long time. Okay, next up, 147. Can you grow Leptoceras together on one rock? I've never tried it, but you might be able to. If anybody else has tried it and it didn't work out, let them know, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could. For some reason, it doesn't seem quite that aggressive towards other ones. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, uh, 148 Orange Leptastria. Then 129, also Orange Leptastria. Yeah, there's a few different varieties of Leptastria that I've seen. People grow chalices together, right? Not really. Not so much. They kind of, they kind of fight, 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 fight. Okay, next up is going to be some Cephastria. Yeah, I, I missed the thing in chat that somebody's saying, you know, ban that person. Missed it. So they got away lucky. different types of Cephastria that we have. The first one is uh, a Harlequin. So th those typically have like a purplish base, yellow tentacles, and the center of the polyp is red. Okay, moving on. These are a couple of the meteor showers. Usually these are more blue and more red. That's kind of like the, the telltale sign. But yeah, you can kind of see it a little bit. And Cephastria are definitely lower light corals. I wouldn't put them in highlight. Auto spell check is killing me today. Yeah, it's fun when you um, type in stuff like Cephastria, like some of the scientific names for stuff, Latin, Latin names, corrects every single one of them. Okay, 153 there is the meteor shower Cephastria, slightly larger one. Okay, 54, 154. Should also be a meteor shower Cephastria, but just smaller. Yeah, a little bit smaller. We'll get there eventually. How many people do you think you have banned since starting the live sales? I don't know, maybe a dozen or so? <clears throat> yeah. Unfortunately, we no longer have contributions from the KKK or ISIS. Okay, next up, 115. It's a Harlequin Cephastria. It's a much smaller one than the first one we showed. And then 156 is a Mardi Gras Cephastria, which is uh, purple and green.
Just wondering, do you have any larger corals? A lot of the larger stuff uh, was shown earlier in the show, like in the teens. All right. Next up, 157. And, and, and all the other thing, uh, Thomas, is that for live shows, um, just in order for us to fit them all in side by side, because we actually have limited space to do a live show. I mean, we can't like run through the entire greenhouse. It's just everything has to be at the same kind of eye level sort of thing. So if we had a ton of large corals, it kind of gobbles up a ton of space too. So instead of having like 200 corals, we might have like 50. So there's, there's kind of some downsides to having large corals. And, and generally speaking, we do rotate some in, like some elegances and acanthophilias and things like that. But there's not going to be a ton of them typically in the live show. Okay, next up, number 158. It's an orchid favitis. Were you popular in school? I don't know if you're talking to them or talking to me, but I definitely was not popular in school. <laughs> Absolutely not. Kids in the, in the early 90s were racists. <laughs> no, it, it's actually funny because um, a lot of the friends I have now from high school were not friends that I had during high school. Like some of my closest friends um, now, they were popular in high school. And we literally reconnected in our late 30s. And in one case, um, one guy, like I, I think I might, I've never actually spoken to him when we were children, but we all kind of got in touch over Facebook. Like our entire high school class suddenly just became friends with each other and everybody kind of got um, reacquainted. Okay, let's, let's go down to 160. And so this particular guy was interesting because like everybody like, this would, would have been when we were all in our early 30s when everybody kind of um, met back up on Facebook and everybody you know wants to like post pictures of their family. It's like, you know, I got married to so-and-so, I've got two kids, a house and a car sort of thing. And so, you know, some people are like, yeah, you know, like I went to medical school and um, one person was like, every single picture he showed was him in a different country. Like all over Europe and South America and stuff like that. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Then the next thing is like, it's him on a red carpet with like some reality TV show stars from like The Bachelor or something like that. And the red carpet is at like the Playboy Mansion. I'm like, huh. This guy is like a million times more interesting than the rest of the people on Facebook. And so we just happened to like click politically on, on certain topics. And so I said, hey, you know what? I bet we would actually get along. You know, we never hung out or talked during high school. But next time you're, you're back in Akron, Ohio, we should totally hang out. And sure enough, like he's like a really, really, really cool dude. So it's funny that like we, we actually became friends, you know, 20 years, 25 years after high school. All right, next up, 161. Uh, these are Paradise Favites. Or er, no, 160, I'm sorry. And then 161 is another Paradise Favites. Okay, so I think we're all caught up. Yes, okay, now we're currently on 161, my bad. <clears throat> uh, let's see, chime in on free shipping. Yes, free shipping over 250. That is true. So. If you happen to have already paid for shipping, don't worry about it, we'll refund it. Yes, shipping is flat rate $39.99, free over $250. And uh, if you order like 10 individual corals, so it's like 10 orders of one coral each, don't worry about it, we consolidate it all on our end. Okay, number 162, Diglo Favides. Yeah, a lot of the really, really popular people um, in my high school, not all of them turned out that well. They were kind of, kind of losers, <laughs> turns out. But um, you know, like what one guy was like, he just said, and he's he's like a really, really, really nice guy too. And we we I actually spend like Christmas 
with his family and like one other family from high school. That's like become a thing. So I actually go and, and hang out with them and their families with their kids and stuff like that for Christmas. Um, but he keeps on saying it's like I was such an idiot back in, in, in high school. Like I should have hung out with you guys the entire time. But it just it just never happened. You know, he had his own group of friends and he just did tons of drugs. And it's so funny now because it's like, I'm totally interested in doing drugs, but I have nobody to do with it. Everybody's got, like, you know, families and kids and stuff like that. They're not, like, going to come with me to, like, Peru and try ayahuasca. That's just never going to happen now. All right, next up, 163. Did I miss 159? All right, I'll just put up the overlay, which is the reverse war coral for Vaidi. So if you guys are curious, it's $55. What number are we on now? 163? Do you feed Favia and Favites? You can. How difficult are rock anemones? They are super easy. Is that strawberry lemonade you have in stock super rare? Yes. Okay, 164. Violet and green Favites. Wenzel Kong, I hate you. I hate you too. All right, uh, what are we on? Let's go to 165. White-eyed Favia. Favias grow a lot more slowly than Favite, so kind of take that into note. People really do change popularity, doesn't matter when you're grown up. That's hella true like whatever's going on in high school for like the younger viewers out there um yeah literally whatever's going on in high school it's not gonna matter a whole heck of a lot okay 167 green pinstripe platygyra <clears throat> Luke, your mom got, your mom wants to try ayahuasca. All right, all right. I'm telling you, we'll go to Peru. <clears throat> okay. Oh, just, just so you know, like platygyra, and here's another one, 168 is another type of platygyra. They tend to be a little bit more sensitive, so, you know, be prepared to, to kind of deal with their finickiness. <clears throat> Alright, 168, Michael. There we go. Yeah, seriously, like, the sort of stuff that I worried about in high school is, like, so dumb, it's hard to even speak out loud. Like, people care so much about what shoes you wore. Like, I would get stressed out because my, I didn't spend enough on shoes. Or, you know, like, I, I couldn't convince my parents to buy me a certain type of Nikes. So I'm going to go to school and get made fun of because of the shoes I was wearing. And I remember, like, I was talking to a, a friend that had just entered college at a local university. And I was, like, uh, shocked when he said that nobody cares what shoes you wear in college. I'm like, Really? I don't even know what's that's what's that all about. Like nobody cares how you dress in college. That's ridiculous, and nobody's gonna care how, how you dress after college. But in high school, it's like the biggest deal. It's silly. All right, next up, one sixty nine. Let's see, 169, okay, 170 is going to be up next. And sneak peek, it's a ZOA that I don't know what it is. I'm not going to ban him for that. He said fart. <laughs> all right, couldn't afford fancy shoes. I spent all my money. Ban whoever made it blurry. 
Yeah. By the way, living with your parents into your 20s is not a bad idea. Want some personal finance tips? Live at home as long as you can. Save your money. Unless you just simply can't stand your parents. Like, I understand that like not everybody's parents are cool. My parents happen to be kind of okay. So I stuck around home for a long time and just did stuff like go to extra college. Not bad. Okay, so what number are we on? I'm lost. Okay, we're okay. This is 169. Correct. I got lost. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. 169 are the are green candy apple zoas. 170 is what I don't know what they are. When was your first girlfriend? I don't know. I totally forgot. Dude, I'm like almost 40 now. I don't remember these things. Uh, 170. Yeah, I don't know what these are. They're pink something or the others. I'm like trying to like catch up on chat. I'm like... Totally... I'm lost. Okay, next up, 171. Fruit Loop Zoas. I know somebody was asking about Zoas soon, and, and we do have some Rastas. You know what, I had Payless shoes also. Like, I thought that was like such, like, such a great deal. And it turns out that they're really not, because they like fell apart in like two weeks. And the one day that I bought like really nice shoes, uh, they lasted me like six years, and in year like five, somebody complimented me on my new shoes. So after that, I've always spent some, some decent money on shoes. If you could only keep one coral, what would it be? I don't know. I don't really have favorite corals, but chat, if, if you know what, ask, ask chat. So if, if you could pick one coral and you have to be limited to only one coral, what would you pick? And just, you could say one type of coral. So like acros could be a thing. You're not just stuck to like only the, a green acro. That would be kind of... 172. All right, 172. So these are lotus petal zoas. Pay less rules for like one week, yeah. One seventy three or Zoas. Seeing a lot of stuff like Zoas or mushrooms, Montipora. Actually an all mushroom tank would actually be pretty cool. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting ones out there. All right. 174 is like a mix of looks like Fiji Solars and uh, a Paleothella of some sort. Okay, next up 175. These are some emerald green pallies. So you can see the difference between Zoas and pallies. Sometimes people are like, um, kind of up in the air as to what the difference is. They're actually really different, but a lot of like the large polyped zoas in the hobby kind of get um, classified in with uh, Paleothella, even though they're just really big zoas. And we do that on our website too. It's not, it's not the best practice, but there really is a pretty big difference. Okay, next up, 176. Don't know what these are, but they're pretty neat. Um, they could be cat's eyes. We just, it, it was late last night when we were kind of like labeling all these. I'm like, not sure what any of these are after a while. <clears throat> all right, next up, 177.
These are the Fiji Solars. Okay. Kryptonite Jawbreaker Shrooms. I think I know what those look like. I like those a lot. I also like Eclectus Discosoma Mushrooms. Those are really cool too. Right, next up, 178. These are Purple Death Paleothelas. One seventy nine are Fiji Rainbow Zoas. I'm kind of blowing through these a little bit more quickly because uh, we've almost gone for three hours, and I was complaining about my voice a long time ago. Okay, one eighty Joker Zoas. How often do you guys feed your ACANs LPS? Well, we feed the tanks every day. We don't, right now we're not making a huge effort to spot feed. Okay, 181 are Fiji rainbows. Have the mushrooms already passed? Yes. Those would be around 120 if you wanted to scroll back through. Okay, 182. Don't know what these are. They look like they could be a couple of different things, but they're slightly different, so I'm not going to even try to figure out a name for those. They look green paper packer-ish, but they're not really. They look orchid-ish, but not really. Yeah. No singing after hours for me. 183 are Leonardo Zoas. Okay, next up, 184, our armor, armor of Gods. So you, we used to call these pallies for the longest time, Armor of God pallies. I think there's always. Okay, so we'll be moving on to yet another group of Zoas that I'm not sure what they are. I need co-hosts. If I had co-hosts that could like talk while I didn't talk, that'd be awesome. Because then we could just, well, I mean, we would need a slightly different setup so we could uh, just put up more corals for sale. Um, but that, not out of the realm of possibility, really. But I would definitely want to have like other people to, to make it more like a podcast. Uh, just, to, I mean... I have no problem talking for three hours, but it might be more fun for you guys to have like some other voices in this process too. So it'd be a little bit more of just like a, a hangout rather than just me babbling into a microphone about Game of Thrones and whatever else comes up. Okay, 186. Oh, wait, what? that was 185, which I didn't know the name of. There's 186 that I also don't know the name of. Okay. And then 187, I do know the name of. These are Sakuras. What's a species of Paleothelas that get really huge in circumference? You're probably thinking of Paleothella grandis. Make eye contact when eating bananas. You're in the wrong stream, son. They get paid way more than I do. Um, 188, Mellow Yellow Zoas. <coughs> One eighty nine metallic rainbow zoas. Darn it, ran out of bottled water. Okay, one ninety are orchid zoas, and we're down to our last ten. And we're basically right up on three hours. What you eating? You mean a banana? Need my calories. 
Okay, next up, 191. So these are the Green Bay Packers. They, they look a lot different than the ones I said kind of look like it. They don't kind of look like it. All right, next up, 192, Fiji Solars. Another group, if you missed the first one. These are kind of neat because they actually have uh, some, some, some odd uh, blending going on on that second polyp there. 193. Don't know what these are. I used to know, maybe, but forgot. Yes, all the rest are Zoas. 194 are cotton candies, which might be the same as those ones that we didn't know the name of, but yeah. Pink. One ninety five or Jack Frost Pallies. One ninety six are pink and gold Zoas. These have grown like crazy for us. That's why they're they're so inexpensive right now. The show is ending soon. Yes, it is. See you later, wireless. Is it safe to mix Zoas? Yeah, it is. They don't really. Uh, or too much. Yeah, show went smoothly. Thanks. Didn't start smoothly. Like we st we started this show with lights falling into a tank. It's awesome. One ninety seven is uh, actually so wait one ninety seven. Yeah, it's a combo Zoa, but it's like uh, the the other part of the combo they're closed. So I think it's like a mix of like radioactive dragon eyes and something else. Uh, one ninety eight. Our com like a combo rock. It looks like it's got three or four different types. The ones in the middle there are Agent Orange. Okay, 199. And our friend the Glare has come back. And lastly, 200. All right, so thanks you guys for tuning in like bugs now thanks spring that now 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 there's bugs to deal with and, and soon uh i'm just gonna be like itching like crazy because like mosquitoes are just gonna descend upon me and also i guess like it's supposed to be uh the year that we get cicadas so yeah one of these shows i'm sure is gonna be like all cicadas in the background you can't even hear me uh received an email from tyler Gordon saying there would also be a raffle don't think so We've never done a raffle, like, ever. I, w I wouldn't even know how to do it, so. Uh, let's see, well, I came here to hear your stories, quarrels are secondary, thanks. Yeah, I do have a lot of stories sometimes. Um, thanks again to the Patreon crowd. These guys have uh, donated for three months now. That's pretty much when we started. Kevin, Nate, Luis, Jeff, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, I do plan on having my last um, last video about Japan coming up here, like I said, probably late uh, this coming week, Thursday, Friday-ish. So stay tuned for that. And I've got some, some video concepts, um, mainly like, like bigger aquarium topic stuff. So hopefully you guys like that stuff too. But that might ha be... We'll see, because I, I wasn't expecting to have to send my camera away to get, to get fixed. So, anyway, thanks you guys. Take care, have a good one. Good night now.